Shout out to Steve Train. Jump on the Steve Train. We real estate disruptors. Hey, everybody. Thank you for joining us for today's episode of Real Estate Disruptors. Today, we've got Ramon and Rodrigo Martinez with Wholesale Sharks. Two more guys in the Phoenix market, and they're going to be talking about wholesaling within the Hispanic community. Now, I am on a mission to create 100 millionaires. The information on this podcast alone is enough for you to become a millionaire in the next five to seven years. If you'll take consistent action, you will become one. Now, we also know you want to be a successful real estate investor. At time, you may feel frustrated and anxious because you're not buying enough houses or not buying them deep enough. I know how deflating that it is walking out of the house without a signed contract. We've helped hundreds of people buy thousands of houses at deep margins. Go to millionairesupport.com, talk with my team so that you may never have to worry about revenue again. The show is also brought to you by our sister company, InvestorLift. Get access to 2 million cash buyers across the country. Go to InvestorLift.com, put in disruptors, and you'll get 10% off. And if you get value today, please tag a friend below, share this episode right now. That way we can all grow together. And this is a live show, so please ask your questions for Ramon and Rodrigo to answer. You ready? Ready. Ready to go. All right. So uh, first question is, what was your life before real estate? Life before real estate was horrible. <laughs> um, you name it. You know, I used to sell English Bulldogs for a while until I landed on television twice, back-to-back weeks. And then I said, this is not the life for me. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's nothing more embarrassing than being chased down the park on the television with, floor. On television with a cage full of dogs. Ah. Stop. Let me just ask you a couple of questions. No. <laughs> <laughs> so that was life pretty much trying to make ends meet like everyone else, trying to find a little hustle to make some cash to eventually get to a point to where we could do something that we feel proud of. But it's just like anyone else, you know, trying to figure out the puzzle. But obviously, it wasn't in that. I think this life was... for me was awesome. Rodrigo's life was cool. I, I thought it was amazing. He's saying horrible. And I'm... For me, for me, it was horrible. What happened to you? Man? Well, so who's older? He's older. He's oh, older. Yeah. All right. So this was way before you got into sales in England, all this other stuff. It was after. This right after. after. Right, after. right after. You can imagine, cushy England job. Yeah. Traveling the country, uh, speaking to the C-suite. Mm-hmm. You know, and then right. all of a sudden I got fired uh, after two years of doing that, mm-hmm. and I had nothing. Well, why so mention to him uh, he dogs. was gonna start getting commission from those types of sales jobs, and it just made sense if they fire him two years within, they don't pay him the commission. So that's when they fired him and started doing the the dog stuff. Well, you were doing well because I remember we've talked about this. I mean, you had a um, or at least a great opportunity when you're working overseas, right? Not a lot of people have that opportunity. So let's talk about what it was right before that. Like, what brought you to England first? Yeah, so, I mean, they found me on LinkedIn. I didn't even know what LinkedIn was at the time, but mm-hmm. one of my white friends did. And so he was always bragging, hey, I have so many connections on LinkedIn. I'm like, yeah, I got more than you on Facebook. <laughs> and so I'm like, I'm a, I've always been very competitive. Mm-hmm. So I created a LinkedIn, and I was like, I was adding everyone all day, trying to beat them in connections, not knowing what the purpose of it was. England company finds me on LinkedIn somehow. They're like, man, we'd like to interview for a position overseas here in Manchester. Like, am I being pranked? I'm pretty sure I'm being pranked. Mm-hmm. But we just kept going with it. And next thing you know, I'm in England working. I'm sitting at a desk in Manchester. Because <laughs> uh, all along, they wanted an American mm-hmm. to go and represent them in America. Yeah. And I was the American that they found. I'm like, oh, crap. Okay, cool. For a week, I think we were Googling, you know, <laughs> people steal your organs, stuff like that. I'm like, they're going to steal my organs. They're going to go to England. And you're like, for whom? Who are these people? You know? Right. So, but you landed some big accounts there. I landed some big accounts. Um, the funny part about that job is that all jobs, they try to do some sort of assessment test to make sure, you know, you, you're competent. And for me, it was the craziest math test I've ever taken in my life. I'm pretty sure I failed it horribly because they were having a conversation. Hey, we have some concerns over your results, Ramon. I'm like, and so my response was, are you looking for somebody to do math problems? Or are you looking for somebody to do sales? Yeah. Because I'm. if you need somebody to do sales, I'm your guy. But if you need somebody to do great at math, it's probably all the other guys that you probably fired before me that were great at math. Yeah. I'm here for sales. Is that what you're looking for? I got the job right after. He's like, I love your response, man. Great I salesperson answer. And so, I mean, I was like, what? I just bull, bull essing. Mm-hmm. Uh, oddly enough, though, six months in, I landed like the biggest account in history for the company, which was Starbucks. 
Okay. Almost what were you four, selling? Four thousand. We were doing consulting work mm-hmm. where we would go in and analyze all their credit card processing fees. And so then we would go back to Visa, MasterCard, and renegotiate. Hey, you know, this was going on. Our data says that they're overpaying with this much. Save the companies millions of dollars a year. We take a small cut, 10, 20% mm-hmm. over a three year course. And so we landed that gig. Uh, we ended up locking up uh, Victoria's Secret right after, Gap, Jack in the Box. I mean, you name it, all the world's largest retailers. So you landed big accounts, and then the suspicion is you got fired before the commissions were paid. Yes. The commissions were about to start hitting like three, four months, but I was complaining because I've been doing it for two years, and they were about to start hitting, and everything just seemed to work out to where my complaints and the commissions were just coming around, and I was done, honestly. Uh, Two years of traveling. I was the guy who was on the plane every day for five days a week. I would never see the family. Uh, You were in England? Traveling back and forth to sell American companies. Yes. I'd be in England waiting for it to be daytime here to start emailing from England twice a month sometimes. Yeah. And then when I'd be back, I would just fly in to all the appointments that I would make from England. So I was just that in my life for two years. So you were talking about being on TV, and it seems like this is like a sore topic for you. Yes, it hurts. So like, I mean, like, is this something like... I hope no one watches on TV or is this like your family is like, Ramon, what's, what are you doing? It was embarrassing. It was embarrassing because I landed on TV the first time my mom calls me. Hey, you're on television. I was like, what? what? Where? What are you talking about? Uh, yeah. And so I was getting, my phone was blowing up from the all the news places trying to talk to me. Because when I started selling English Bulldogs right after I lost my England job, I did it because I needed some money. So I'm the worst parent in the world. I had just bought my daughter's uh, English Bulldog like a couple weeks before. Uh, for like 1300 bucks, So I get back home was the first thing to go. Maybe somebody will want that bulldog. So I added like $300 on top and sold it for 1600 And called the guy back and like, hey, bring me another one. And I, that weekend I had him go back and forth. And I you were sold, flipping dogs. I sold six of them that weekend in two days. So I made more money that weekend than... Why were you on the news? Two years later, I was on the news because somebody's dog got sick. The first time ever. And they took... They, I ended up speaking to the people. We took it to the park when we first got it. I'm like, dude, it's a baby. It's going to get sick. If you can't, you need to be in, indoors until you get all the shots. Yeah. So I ended up giving them their money back and letting them keep the dog. I'm like, I don't want any issues. Uh, but after the second time that happened, somebody complained. I'm like, I'm done. That's when I reached out to Rodrigo. Now, you said life was awesome. Mm-hmm. What were you doing for real estate? Well, not a lot of people know, but uh, we used to stay in a band. Like a child Mexican mariachi band. That's what I was thinking when it's like life before real estate. You guys had a mariachi band. Like, how was that not awesome? I mean, for me, it was awesome. Um, You know, you're in high school. People know you because of the band. So I think that's where it helped me and him be partners. I know a lot of companies usually don't work. The partnership, um, well, for us, it's always been, you know, we're in a band. We both sing, learn the songs. You know, we get in a rhythm. So I always knew that we should be in business together somehow. Uh, So I got the band finished. I got my own job, architectural designing for a company called Intel, doing designs and all that stuff. Which I think you used to work at. I used to work at Intel as well, yeah. my light stalking. (laughs) Did the whole fab stuff, designing all this stuff. But what happens is when you're in a band and you come from an artistic background where you enjoy just being free, um, you get put in a cubicle, you just hate it. So what happened, I just hated that kind of life. So everything changed the second that uh, Ramon said, hey, you should get your license. And I said, okay. I'm quitting immediately. So I quit the Intel stuff without even having any background in real estate. Mm-hmm. Um, got my first couple of deals. Ramon's like, hey, I want to take you to uh, to China, which is, I don't know, where, for my birthday. He's random. And then I was like, okay, I was going through some weird breakup stuff, and he didn't even know. But I said, okay, screw it. Uh, I don't like flying on the plane. I hate all this stuff. The crazy part with that was um, it was my first commission check or second commission check. I paid the the whole flight. We came back, and then me going back to a nine to five in a cubicle after being in China, Japan, uh, like we flew all over just on my two commission checks for real estate. I think it was like ten grand of just spending all that money on flying back and forth. It did something to me. I, like I couldn't be there anymore. Like I saw the world even bigger. So that that pushed me to do something else. And Ramon's like, "Hey, you should do this full time." Um, meanwhile, I was trying to get him to join me. And he was still doing all these sales with Toyota Secret. So I was waiting for him to quit and come join me. But uh, the, the moment he got fired, I was happy. I yeah. was like, oh, he got fired about time. He can join my real estate <laughs> stuff. But unfortunately, he was going to finish his test that same weekend or the Monday afterwards. 
And he's like, hey, I just sold like 10 dogs. <laughs> and I was like, oh, no way, man. Uh, he's being profitable now. So he didn't quit. And then so he started doing the dog stuff and was making more than me um, in traditional real estate. Uh, eventually, he quit again and then joined me uh, by getting his license. So you were a successful realtor. I was making about get, 100 plus a year. Yeah, I, you I, I, a they gave me a pin. They uh, do so much. Yeah, on the traditional side, yeah. Pin so giver. Ramon seems to be more on the adventurous, spontaneous slash crazy mm. side. Yeah. How was it when you guys first started working together as a realtor? It was duo? horrible. Well, the, I always go back to the thing that my mom would always say when we go on to tour the United States. Um, remember, I'm like three, four years younger than him. So my mom would say, I'm 13, 12. Hey, Rodrigo, take care of your older brother, Ramon. <laughs> like on every trip, take care of, your, care of Ramon. And I'm like, why? He's older than me. Like, why? He's like 17 and I'm like 12. Hey. Well, I mean, he's usually spontaneous. He says yes to everybody. Hey, want to go over here? Yes. You want to do this? Yes. So, but I think that helps because that opens up so many doors. And it was the same thing with, uh, with real estate. You know, he takes bigger chances than anybody else. Even the, with the markets recently or last year, he goes big. You know, he, he, if you tell a story of how you got started, I mean, he wouldn't have been able to start the company with all of his credit cards he was using. So if he didn't have any money, he was using all the credit cards to pay for all these softwares, all these things. So, But the reason why I say it was horrible is because I, I tried. The moment I got my license, first of all, it took me like four oh. tries <laughs> to get the license. I, couldn't, I wasn't paying attention. I didn't. Maybe it was the math section. The math section, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> So the, I had a client, uh, I showed him like 10 houses. By the end of it, he's like, is, is there any more? I'm like, no, that's it. Yeah. There's more houses, that's it. This is a client was, that I shared at me. and I took him, you know, like training day. He like show him these houses and I'm driving and then he's like, they want to see more. But the guy asked, hey, do you have any more? And he says, no, there's no more. And I was like frozen. <laughs> and then they're like, oh, I told the clients, hey, show me these houses. He's like, no, there is more. <laughs> and then you, he wanted to be, I'm a listing agent, he said. So he started doing the listing set as well. Mm -hmm. Did you do well on the listing side? I sucked at that as well. <laughs> the first time they canceled on me, I went and grabbed my phone. You, mother, why'd oh, you man. cancel? And uh, that was horrible as well. So then I realized that I sucked at listings and at showing. So I'm like, what is there for me? There's nothing. Like I suck yeah. at this. And then we stumbled onto wholesaling. So when did you, when did you start uh, the, the realtor side? Uh, six years ago. Six years ago, years and ago. then you started two years after that? Yeah. And then when did you guys start wholesaling or flipping, whichever, however wholesaling. you got into it? So we stumbled onto it by accident. He wanted to build a mansion on top of a mountain, mm -hmm. and he bought a lot, like, in Levine area for, like, 30 grand or something. And meanwhile, somebody's offering him, like, 50 grand. So he's like, but how do I do it? They're like, don't worry, I'll help you out. He was wholesaling it, not even I knowing. I didn't know what it was. He didn't even, he's like, I didn't even pay for it, and I got money at the end. I was like... That. How do we do that? <laughs> we started Googling. Doo -doo 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 -doo. Yeah. And wholesaling came up. And we're like, okay, well, that's, I'm going to give that a try. Yeah. Maybe we could do more of that. And that's when we stumbled onto like Real Estate Disruptors, Max. And all so that. I think Real Estate Disruptors was the first event we went to. That was the first event where we yeah. first met you. I, I recall Ramon's like, hey, I got this event. And I looked at it. I was like, well, I, I don't want to go because it's, I don't know what wholesaling is. First mm -hmm. of all, it's not a traditional real estate. So he's like, there's going to be food. And I was like, okay, I'm in. So <laughs> that was the catch. I recall the food. And then. The, uh, David Buster. Yeah. Yeah. So I was excited about that. And then once we got in there, I'm like, I know a couple of these guys here. They're realtors. I'm like, okay. So it might be pretty cool. It was such an amazing event for me because to find so many people speaking the same language that I wanted to learn, I was just like in heaven. I'm like, oh my God, every single person. There's so many people that were new as well. So yeah. I didn't feel like I was left out or like I wasn't worth as much as everybody that knows everything because there were new people there. So I'm like, hey. You know, I was making connections with everyone, trying to, you know, learn as much as I could. And it was just great. It was amazing, I think. And then we're waiting always for the other one. When's the next one? I haven't yeah. seen the invitation. Yeah, we used to do those every month. So um, how long? So you did the first one by accident. Mm -hmm. Tell me about, like, did you immediately do another wholesale deal or was it, like, some time transpired? Before you figured out what was like, how to how well, to repeat it. Well, for Ramona, I remember we wanted to do a flip, a fix and flip, and mm -hmm. uh, he ended up wholesaling, like one of your first or second or wholesale deals to me. So <laughs> he's like, "Hey, I'll, I'll wholesale, I'll sell you a deal, I'll wholesale." So I think he locked it up too high because mm -hmm. we didn't make any money on that. We actually lost money, but uh, that was his first one of his first that he sold to me, and we got further into the wholesale game for that. 
We were all over the place, man. We were at the court steps at some point. We we're out there just waiting, trying to pick something up with one of our buddies let us borrow a ten thousand dollar cashier's check mm -hmm. that trusted us. Chava, saludos. Yeah. That guy, he probably funds most of the wholesalers that you know. Mm -hmm. uh, he's Sweet. a Mexican dude that does construction. Yeah, he's good. Uh, he actually used to work with Pace for a while. He used to do all his projects. Mm -hmm. So pretty cool guy. He trusted us because he was he used to hire our band a lot, and so he gave us a check for ten thousand bucks. We met him at a Applebee's. Yeah. Hey man, we need a cashier check for ten grand. We're gonna go to the court steps. We're gonna try to get a deeply discounted deal, and we'll cut you in. You know, you fix houses. Like, well, let's let's go. He just gave us a check the next day. I sure. was asking, where are you gonna get this money? Like, nobody's just gonna give I'll you ten. Find a guy that has money. You found a guy. And so, well, how, did you, how did you find that guy? He said just. Well, he was renting me a house. Okay. But also, he was renting me a house because we he used to hire the band to play for. His he used to parties. hire us. Hire we're us his band, band for his parties. He liked but the did music. you know he had money. We didn't know he had money, but we would always see him fixing houses and this and that. So we're like, maybe we assumed maybe he has a little bit of money, and then yeah. he helps us fix them too. And well, because I, I I like what you did here, right? And it sounds like really obvious when you listen to it. But there's so many people like I don't know where to get money from. Where do I go? Right? Yeah. They just assume it's like other people don't have money, so you just we didn't know. Well, okay, so actually, yes, this is how we this is how we found out he had money. We were trying to help his dad buy a condo for like 30 or 40 grand. Uh -huh. And so the realtor was like, hey, uh, we need proof of funds. And so, hey, we need proof I of recall. funds. And he sends us a picture of his bank account, multiple six figures. I'm not going to say this yeah. the right amount, the exact amount. Multiple six figures in there. And I'm like, oh, this guy has money. And so that's how we put two and two together. Then it's only 10, man. We'll try to find you a good deal, blah, blah, blah. So you, guys went over, in. you guys overpaid. We overpaid. So, so how that deal work out? So... So we wholesale the deal to him for 5K more, and we made 5K up front. And then when we sold it, we lost 5K. But we were like, we're not going to screw this relationship up over five. So we we asked everyone for money, and then we gave him back five that we had lost because mm -hmm. we were losing money. We gave him back his five, and he made five. that we were losing, and then we gave him another 2,000 that we came up with so he could be like, have a good experience. We're the ones that lost. Mm -hmm. But then he trusted us again, but now we're more careful. Needless to say, we're like losing money left and right, trying to learn, trying to learn, trying to learn. We're like, one of these days, we're going to make something. The second deal that we did, I made $180 when everybody split the, oh, yeah. the profits at the end. In your time? I mean, you lost all your time. I spent a month cleaning a hoarder house that, that we bought at an auction. Yeah. The worst experience of my life. I paid money for people to clean it. And at the end, when they gave me my cut, like he transferred me $180. But we didn't lose money. Well, I mean, I guess I lost kind of money for the cleaning. So, like, what was your initial reaction when you got the $180? I was kind of happy. There's money coming in, but it was still... It's better than zero. Yeah, because we had to go to court and this and that, and it was just a long experience that would never end. I think that's uh, that's where I sharpened my skills. Um, I made sure I learned the whole process of flipping, where do I get the container bins, who do I call, yeah, the courts. Cleaners. We went through the court process with the the lawyers. So we're just sharpening our skills. I mean, we learned about probate, all these different things. We lost money all the way, but uh, I think once we really needed those skills, they kicked in, which was all last year and the year before. That's when we were, we were our sharpest. Well, I were think you guys I, discouraged, uh, I mean, in this process? We were super discouraged, but I think now it's a blessing in disguise because a lot of people say fail often and as fast as you can. Mm -hmm. And Lord knows we were failing super <laughs> fast we're, we're than anybody we knew because yeah. everybody wins except us. And then we went in another flip with another cousins. We lost again. So we, every single experience was a loss, but it was a different type of loss. And he he had like 50 grand saved at some point yeah. from from the wholesale deal that he did. And we lost it in another flip. He All lost, his money was gone. We, he lost the whole 50. So we're like losing left and right and learning and learning and learning and learning. And I said, okay, yeah, we're the only ones that lose at everything. But guess what? Once we win, we're going to be the only ones that win too. Mm -hmm. You know, fast forward. You know, four years, like, we did $6 million last year. Yeah. Yeah. You know, when before we were the ones losing left and right, and nobody would lose but us. Nobody wanted to lose. Our family, oh, it's too bad that you lost, but I need my money. Yeah. So mm -hmm. we would always lose. Like, we were the biggest losers. And now, you know, like, I could say, okay, well, we lost at the beginning a lot, but also right now at the end we're winning a lot. And the you thing know? is that you, you become sharper since you're betting more on yourself. Um, if Ramon was picking up 12 houses, 15 houses, 20 houses, just in one week, we'll pick them up, 
immediately put them through the ringer of let's list them, let's wholesale them, let's do whatever we have to do ASAP. Yeah, I think the biggest loser also has the biggest experience. Yeah. You know, because you have to go through all the scenarios and some people only lose once, but that means that they only learned once. Mm -hmm. You know, but if you go through every single horrible scenario possible, you're going to have to be so, so much more experienced. Yeah, our first flip fell out of contract, was it seven times? Seven times. Seven times. I was painting the tree at we, one we point. I thought it was the tree. The tree. tree so I grabbed tree. paint, normal paint. I was painting the white, tree white, white around to make it look like a park. It was nice. I saw a video of me at, at midnight trying to get out of that deal, painting yeah. a tree. Uh, Vin, <sighs> Vincer came around there, which is canceled. Horrible. And then, okay, well, let's... Is it the tree? I was painting the tree at midnight. <laughs> so we picked up a lot of skills to be able to make sure things sell first time. Mm. Uh, we were, Now we just hire an inspector before we enlist. Everything's fixed. We usually hire the, the inspector that I hated the most that would bring in, bring up anything, like any yeah. small item. That's my guy for our what, flips. Uh, I mean, when you, as you guys were discouraged, what kept you guys going? Because it's easy to quit. You said, you know, the person that quit fails once, right? Learns once. Like, how did you guys uh, get through that? Um, I ha well, I well, this is the thing. Uh, we were never in it for the money. So us not getting money wasn't really getting us discouraged. We were in there for the freedom and the time and to be able to hang out all day. Hey, I was hanging out with my brother till midnight. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Right? We're working. We're trying to change our lives. And I think that's a that's a good point to make. People that get into real estate thinking, I'm going to get into real estate because I need to make a lot of money. Like, they're going to be discouraged from day one because you don't make money in real estate day one. Hell, you might not make money in year one. But if you get into real estate with that mentality, you failed from day one. And every time that you fail, it's going to feel horrible. But I got into real estate for freedom and happiness and be able to hang out with the family. So guess what? From day one, I was winning. From day 100, I was winning. Because I never, I was already getting what I wanted, you know. And then eventually some money would slip in somehow. It's only a matter of time. But I was happy every day. I got, on my side, I think uh, i never do it for the money either. I mm -hmm. would have just stayed as an engineer, architect. And I was already moving up like crazy. I, I think uh, I was able to work in that he world. He quit his way to the top. I, I quit. I literally quit, quit my way to the top. Every company I worked for, I became so good where I would say, hey, I'm going to quit. I got a better offer, which I didn't. And I would tell them I'm doing it again. And they would give me a raise. And then I would quit. And a promotion. Show these other guys, hey, I just made more. And this is what I'm coming in at. And then I would spend a year, become very valuable, get a raise before I quit. And then I kept doing it. And then uh, at some point I was making like 45 bucks an hour and like four years or three years of doing that. But I learned to work with a lot of teams. That's what I was telling him. My, my engineer mind is working with multiple trades, which is the same thing here. I told but him there's no difference. You depleted your savings though. Yeah. I mean, that that, that didn't. Went, uh, well, I mean, I never had savings. The only reason I had those savings and those flips was because I ran into wholesale without even knowing, right? So I had enough right. from those couple of ones. And I was then a big spender. I just I just spend it all, but I think I'm able to create more money out of nowhere. Yeah. Um, I I think not seeing it like a, a job makes it seem like we're getting free money. Even though somebody would say, "No, you work. You've been putting the work." But for us, since it's not a job, it's not work. So yeah, therefore, when enjoy. we lost 50k, his 50k, we we're like, "Eh, it's free money." Yeah. <laughs> you know, that we would always call it free money, even though we it's had worked. Money. And somebody said, hey, "You work for that." For us, it wasn't work. You know, we were going and it was showing up and we're like, ah, free money, man. It's all so good. I want to put you on a spot a little bit. So you said it's not about the money, yeah. right? But on uh, on Instagram, right, yeah. you're in front of your Lambo. I, I can't remember what color. Is it gold? Gold, yeah. Oh, yellow one. Yellowish, yeah. goldish. Yellowish, goldish, right? Salt and gold. Yeah. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> so, you know, like when you say it's not about the money, but you're posting, you know, pictures of the Lambo on your Instagram, like what message are you trying to send? That I don't care about money. First time I got money to afford a Lambo, I gave it away mm -hmm. to the Lambo company. Yeah. I could have kept the money you if it was about the money. Right. But to me, it wasn't you, about the money. Oh, how much you need? A hundred? I just happened to grab a hundred this week. Here, well, take it. Well, in reality, if it was about the money, you keep the money. I keep the money. And right. then, but I gave the money away for the get, Lambo. Yeah. Luckily, it appreciates and I can still get my money back right now. Yeah. I've, I've gotten offers higher than what I got So it's it about the Lambo, not the money. So it was about the Lambo, <laughs> not the money. And the money's yeah. in there, you know? And I think... I don't think I rushed the Lambo, to be honest. Because, I mean, I could have gotten the Lambo right a while back when I made my first 100K. Mm -hmm. um, and I could have rushed it, and I think it would have been wrong. But at this time, I think we had gotten enough skills and enough development and enough losses and enough. We tried everything, every single marketing strategy. And now, like, even if we, if buying the Lambo was the wrong decision, it was the right decision for me because it made me feel good. It made me feel like, 
You know, it gave me more strength to keep going every morning when I wake up and I see that thing and motivates me. When you're having the worst day of your life and you're leaving your office and you get into your Lambo and you're borderline crying and upset, driving on the freeway in your fucking Lambo, <laughs> you tell yourself, I'm driving in a Lambo. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I had a horrible day, but I'm driving in a Lambo. Back in the day, I used to drive in my little Honda and had a horrible day. Yeah. Uh, I think the Lambo is more like a marker. When you get a huge win and you get that Lambo, you you marker that moment. So every time you get in the Lambo, you feel like how you felt I, when you grabbed I, the Lambo. I so. remember you used to tell me like this all the time based on that was, I would ask him, hey, we can do one flip. You're like, Dude. Matter of fact, <laughs> I brought you a gift. Boom, there you go. Thank you. you got it. <laughs> so, and that's the same color, right? It's the same color, replica. So I remember you used to tell me all the time, it was like I would question because I'm about you know, mitigating risk, this is crazy, everything does is crazy. In my mind, it's crazy and I wouldn't do it myself. Why are you spending so much on this, spending so much on that? How, why so many flips? Um, so the biggest thing was, I would ask him, why are we getting 12 houses just in one week? Are you crazy? He's like, well, I want to know if we're capable of doing it. And I'm like, what do you mean we're capable? Well, I want to test us. He's like, I want to know how many houses are, the, uh, 20, is it 20 houses a month that we weren't able, to, we're not going to be able to be at that level? And like with anything we did, he would just go above and beyond to see if we're able to hold that pressure and actually live up to that. He said, if we're not able to do 20, okay, was it 10? Is it five? Is it three? Well, we I knew at the know. beginning that our le our level of pressure was one. We would fail with the one and then we would try again and fail again. And eventually, yeah, two, like three. how many do we need to fail? Like I was trying to find out where our <laughs> boiling point of failure is. 10? Yeah. No. Okay, we did great with 10. 12? No. 14? You know, and I think like our point of that's enough. It was like around 13 or 14. 13 or 14. Yeah. I mean, just being us two and then our small, tiny crew. So it wasn't. But then that also gives you a lot of industry knowledge, like going through all those different scenarios with buyers and sellers. You see, you have your pulse in the market. Whereas right now, if you tell me, would you buy 13 houses right now? I would say no, because I bought five right before the thing went horrible. Because I'm always testing, like, what's the number? I wouldn't buy one. Like, I'd be hesitant to buy one right now for flip, fixing What um. What are some struggles that you guys face, right? You're growing up to 13. What are some of the struggles you faced? Just manpower. I mean, you know, we had a small team. It was just my parents and their my friends. Parents and their friends. That yeah. they made at the Home Depot. And at, at that many houses, like, we just, we didn't have enough people covering all the houses. So they would sit longer because nobody was fixing them. And, like, you, you either grow the team or you don't. And we were yeah. like, oh, I don't think we can grow the well, team. Well, I, I think it was great having ha too many houses. Uh, it made us sharper, smarter. Uh, most of the houses, I already knew we could probably wholesale half of them. So we're like, okay, we'll wholesale half of them, um, sell them to someone that wanted to do a flip. So we were able to connect to more, with more people because we needed to get rid of these houses somehow. So we started getting more creative on that side. But uh, we wouldn't have been we wouldn't have been able to find all these other routes if we weren't had that massive amount of pressure to get rid of them. Um, so being comfortable would have just not made us grow at all yeah who uh who guided you guys along the way um i'm just friends really i mean reaching out to people um your team has always been very helpful whenever we have any questions we reach out to your team and we'd always they'd always be available to answer and um just having those relationships from going to events and asking people questions and this and that but honestly sometimes we could be a little bit stubborn and not ask questions and just land on our face because yeah. we, sometimes we, we feel like people think we know everything. So we can't ask people questions because they're going to know that we don't know everything. Yeah. So we've landed on our face plenty of times. I mean, you know. Well, you were in our program for a bit. Yeah. yeah. He was. Which you is did. an amazing program. I highly recommend it. That program made me so much money. Yeah. Insane amounts of money. I think you were giving it away, too. I'm like, what yeah. a great deal. Yeah. So I'm just thinking about it right, right now. Your first event was our free event at Dave & Buster's. Yes. Yeah, yeah. The first Where one. you had Carlos Reyes yeah. walk in. Yeah, with, that's the first one. With the that was that was the first one. With the, the yeah, they walk in with the Memphis Mafia behind. Oh no, they had a mafia. No, Carlos, yeah. Carlos was dressed <laughs> yeah. up pretty good, <laughs> uh, but I didn't realize like uh, that. You know, you guys started there. That's, that's where we started. That's awesome. Yeah, he, that's he dragged me. Everyone We're dragged me. Standing there, and I was like, uh, <laughs> I recognize that Mexican, uh, <laughs> and it was Max. Like we ran. He actually used to. List all the houses for Max. Oh, like, oh, the Max is real. So somehow he was connected to the guy that you had right there, mm -hmm. and like, oh my God, like what a small world. Yeah, I think he yeah. had had a separator from his partner or something mm -hmm. happened, and then I didn't see him anymore. I'm like, and this is so a he sign. sent me a flyer. I'm like, okay, well, 
is there food? So I was there. He's like, I know that guy. He's like, oh, I, I know that guy. He's like, who is that guy? He's okay, put cool. his banner of we buy houses in front inside the mall and his little yeah. realtor kiosk. And- so the, the support that we had along the way, me just thinking about it, I've always uh, tried to um, find someone that's seasoned. Uh, I have a couple lenders that I work with that helped me all from the start of a real estate. You know, when I was a realtor and I started, and they would give me a bunch of buyers. They would give me a lot, a lot of listings. But I would always lean on them, title companies, escrow officers that I still know and help us a lot. Um, I always figure that I don't know enough, but I want to learn. So I would uh, always make these calls to these loan officers, these other investors that I know or title people. Um, I've been a big believer that if you're an amazing plumber, it's because you know what the electrician is going to do, what the HVAC guy is going to do, what the concrete guy is doing. Because if you're going to put your pipe here and the AC goes there, you're going to have to move it. Electrical goes here, you have to move it. Same thing with like with Intel. I was telling him that I have to know where I have to be at, but for me to be great, I have to know where everybody has to be at. Mm-hmm. Same thing here, like the wholesaler has to be at this price. Title knows that they have to be at this price for the deal to work. The buyer at the end has to buy it somehow. So if I have all these things in my mind um, and everybody's happy, everybody knows where they have to be at, it's a successful deal. And luckily to that, we don't have many deals that fall off. Um, and that's made us, you know, put more deals on the board. Um. Tell me about some of your guys' biggest victories. Um, I think biggest victory is really not monetarily. Uh, it's more it's more about being able to have the life that you can give your kids that you wanted, that you always dreamed of. Um, and for me, I always visioned every single thing about my life. Like I would have pictures of mansions and and then I would add a little car in front of the picture. And then I would crop myself in there like a vision board kind of. And I still have those vision boards and just visualizing that. Sometimes I would lay in the in my backyard while it was raining and just visualizing. I would, I would daydream in the middle of the rain just sitting there, like trying to force it and make it happen, make it happen. My wife has a picture of me just laying there in the middle of the rain just visualizing our next life. And next thing you know, like, I'm there. I'm inside the house. I'm in, I'm in front of the Lambo. And, you know, just being able to offer that life to my kids is amazing because they grow up so quick, you know. Like, but they're three, four years away from being 18. The other one's three, four years from having a quinceañera. Those moments go fast. So for me, uh, I'm trying to sacrifice myself right now and give them that as a gift of their childhood. And then, you know, later on I could do other things. But right now, uh, I think that's my biggest win, being able to hurry it up and give them that as quickly as possible, you know? Yeah, that's awesome. Could I be more smart with my money? Could I, did I need all those things? No, because you don't need those things for kids to feel loved and, you know. But that's just my vision. When I was growing up, you know, I would always see it on TV and I, Dumb and Dumber movie. They would show up in a fancy car. And, <laughs> like that, I grew up with that, you know, and yeah. that's just what I wanted. And I, real estate allowed me to, to do that. Um, luckily, I rode a great wave when everything was going great to allow me to get that now. Now we're more conservative, but we're also smarter because of all the L's that we've taken. It's crazy how he can say uh, that that's his why motivation, but me and him were completely opposites. Like, I'm not married, I don't have a wife, I'm single, so I, I what's your why? You know, he, he'll do it for the kids and all this stuff. Um, and, I mean, for me, it's always been uh, some kind of satisfaction that you created something amazing that, that worked. And I think that's more coming from my engineering, architectural mind, where I want to build something that people can see that it worked and, and be proud of it. So I'm, I never do things for the money. I always think of myself more of, have you seen that movie, The Spartans? You mm-hmm. know, they're all just going there. Like they're not doing it for money. They're just fighting for hey for victory. So I've always been the kind of guy that I don't want to. I don't want to be the the uh, the weakest link. Mm-hmm. I want to make sure that we're gonna succeed, and then I'm just gonna bring my A game. I, I don't care about the money. I just want feel like the victory. Okay, we're making this thing work. It's satisfaction. satisfaction. And honestly, I mean, if I'm thinking about it with a little bit of thought, for us, like one of the biggest wins is this being on the show. Mm-hmm. I'll be honest, because yeah. yeah. it's never been about the stuff. I could care less. Um, because I mean, you don't bring just anybody on the show. Right. We've we've hinted for the longest we, time. We stalked Steve for years. <laughs> we stalked you for years, Steve. Like we chased you to Hawaii <laughs> a couple times. True story. Yeah. Like true is, story. Yeah, and no, we've bumped into each other in Hawaii. Hey, hey Steve, how you doing? In the lobby by the pool. Random. <laughs> and the third time you didn't see us, but we didn't want to make yeah, it awkward. The restaurant. So for for us, I mean, to see all the people that you've had on here, amazing, super humans. Like it's very humbling, and and I and I know for a lot of people out there, just like us, that maybe are starting or have been in for a minute, 
this is like their holy grail, you know, like yeah. being able to to come to to this show because you know, like all of the smartest people in the world and in real estate and wholesale have passed through here, and this is for us. I mean, this is amazing. Like you can't you can't pay your way into the show. We've no. tried. Yeah, you know, like <laughs> how much do you need, Steve? Come on, like what You're do you gross. what does Steve need to have us on the show? Like what is it? I don't know, man. He just won't have us on the show. And then, for, and all of a sudden, we get a message. Hey, Steve wants you. Like, I don't know where. What did I text you, Annette? I texted Annette. Oh M- my god. G, yeah. I texted her. O-M-G. Oh my god. <laughs> I'm like, I thought it was gonna be like ten years or something. And all of a sudden, for that, um, this is something very, very important to us. Like for else. And even with the, I think the wholesale sharks event is the crazy part. With that, we're waiting for the next, the next one to go. And then Ramon's like, hey, we we want to make a small little meetup or something. And that was all based on the when you guys had the disruptors event every month. Mm-hmm. Um, the crazy part about Ramon is supposed to be at a hundred people event at the bottom of our office, and then I know he's like, "We're up to a thousand, and we're like, "We can't fit him here." Insane. I didn't um, know how that. We're looking happened. for quinceanera venues to hold it at, and eventually he's like the Sheraton. Or, That's how the events yeah. got started. <laughs> we were supposed to make it a small one. Do we have a thousand people registered? I don't yeah. think they're gonna fit downstairs. And so that just kept on going. I'm like, as long as people keep signing up, we'll keep doing them, um, for the, giving back to the community. And, and they've always been free. Like, that was a, the the same thing, like, with you guys' event. Mm-hmm. It was free. Like, anybody can go and join. If it would have cost anything, five bucks or anything, Ramon probably would have gone at that moment. Like, hey, we can't spend this money. But uh, it just opened the doors for so many people. You guys did it. So that's our, our same mindset on our side. Just make it free. You know, you don't know whose lives are going to change. Yeah. No, I mean that's huge, right? Because yeah. again, I didn't I had no idea that my event was your guys' first yeah. event. So that's, that's that was, yeah. I mean it's like a full, yeah, full yeah. Well a wholesaler told me, Are you going to this disruptors event? I'm like, what is that? <laughs> oh, it's a real estate event where everybody all the whole He was just giving me all the information. I'm like, Yeah, we're going. I didn't even know it existed. Yes, yeah. we're going. We were there, he didn't even go. <laughs> and all of a sudden, <laughs> like, we oh my god, this is amazing. What is the the biggest uh purchase or deal you guys have done? I guess just my personal property, really. Mm-hmm. I mean, the rest is just, you know, it varies. Uh, we try to to purchase under, like, 500K mm-hmm. properties. That's kind of our niche. We don't really try to go above that. But, I mean, my personal property, I guess that's probably it. Um, I feel I didn't feel that great when I purchased it. I felt like, oh, my God, what am I doing? It's too oh, nosebleeds. I can't keep this up. Like, how long until they take it away from me? Yeah. And and then, But to to me, I said... They're, I'm either going to grow into the person that lives here and can afford this, or they're just going to take it from me after a while, and I'll say, hey, it was fun. Well, it lasted. Yeah. And it was like 50-50. I'm like, which one is it going to be? Well, I love that mindset because you can't lose with that mindset, right? If they take it all and you start over, like, it's you're, a just, great story. you're just going to keep going. It's going to make the book that much better. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't, always I don't think the, the grind has even stopped as our level of how much we're actually wanting it i don't know what it is to be honest we just want it so bad and uh like for me i'll be at a starbucks there's a uh, luckily there's a 24-hour starbucks near my house i didn't know they had those i always send pictures to this guy like uh 1 a.m in the morning what are you doing at the starbucks like i'm looking for properties i'm doing this and that and that i told him dude every property that, that i find that it's a deal in our mind we're like hey that's our new cancun trip taking all whole family like we don't we want to create new business to be able to pay for these things. We don't just want to like take the money. Um, well, let's talk about that, right? Because the one thing I really do like seeing, you know, in your guys' stories, is you're mm-hmm. consistently taking your family, right? Yeah. yeah. Sometimes it feels great when everything's going right, but when the business is going a little bit hectic, we remember, oh my god, we flew twenty people to Cancun. Oh my <laughs> and, god, from Mexico. Uh, the, the crazy part <laughs> for that, like, I'm so opposite in the sense that. I'm conservative. I don't want to spend every dollar, whatever, before, like, before we work together. Um, he's just been going crazy with the trips. But I find that okay now. Like, I understand why and the purpose of time. Mm-hmm. So once you start uh, knowing that time is valuable, not because I might have a lot of time, unless I get run over or something, but but my grandma doesn't have a lot of time. You know, hey, she doesn't have the, the 100, uh, you know, whatever years, 20 years. Um, so I think... We're just doing it because based on other people's time, you know, my parents' time, um, maybe my uncles that are a little bit off, you know, uh, we, we try to make sure that we're taking these people on the trips that we want to give them memories. And and a lot of people say passive income. I said, like, passive memories. You know, yeah. I, I want to have all these memories this year. You can't remember something that you did in a year that you didn't do anything. Yeah. So that whole year is, like, shot. 
Um, so we make sure we're heavily investing in memories instead of like houses and stuff like that. But I know it, it might be feel different for other people that that's a mentality. Hey, I think it's yeah. awesome. I think yeah. it's inspiring. So yeah. uh, another odd question is uh, we did a deal last year. I think it was last year, right? Where we made a 50K assignment fee. And you You're welcome. <laughs> have a very abundant mindset, right? So one of the things that we find is there are some people who are like, I can't believe you made this much money on me, right? Like, you, this is ridiculous. But that's not your perspective at all. Not so, at all. So talk to me about that, because I think there's a lot of uh, people out there that don't quite have that mentality. I'm always looking for everybody to win, and, and it's weird. Like, I've some guy I, I put on Instagram the other day, hey, man, I'm looking for a deal here. Somebody texted me and introduced me to another person. The next day, I had a deal that the guy said, yeah, send me the contract. I sent him that deal to that one person that introduced me and said, hey, send him the contract, lock him up, we'll go 50-50 on it to make up for you introducing me to this person. Like the very next day, I was trying to repay back. Even yesterday, somebody assigned a contract to us, and they're like, hey, man, um, if you give me the deal back, I'll give you an extra 2500 and, and I knew we were making like almost 20000 on the deal. And I said, L listen, let's do this, man. How much are you making on the deal? Because if you're making... Uh, X amount, or if you're making less, we'll just go 50-50 with this. Yeah. Like, it's all good. I don't want you to make less than us. And so we ended up just chopping it up. Like, we we're making like five more. Hey, it's all good, man. Let's just go 50-50. Like, we have an extra five than you. What are you making, 10? Mm. Let's both make 15, and let's just move forward. So we're never about that mentality about just me, 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 me. Yeah. Like, we love seeing people win, because at the end of the day, these are the people that are bringing you deals. You want them to be alive, because what happens when they make money like their marketing gets stronger. They can invest in more training. They can get better. And then that makes you better as well. Like I think I don't a, lot, see myself... a lot of people don't see that from Ramon. He he actually gave a car to a wholesaler that was down on his luck. It was in what, Atlanta or something like that. Yeah. And the crazy part, he helped them with that car that, that helped him so much in his life. He started doing more deals and he even sold a deal to Pace, right? He, did. he met him over there. Oh. like, hey, this wholesaler brought me this deal. He knows you guys. He knows Ramon. He was sleeping in inside the, of the post office. In the post office, and Ramon yeah. had the pictures. He has the video, and he bought him a car from here. It was, in, it was just ten thousand dollar car. But I remember, was it was it Earl? Earl, Earl. yeah, oh. yeah. So you know, you don't know who you're gonna help, but he usually does that to a lot of people. That guy's turned his whole life yeah. around. He turned the whole life around. I think he's living like a golf course right now. He's doing something. really well. I think he owns a golf course or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's insane. And and I I didn't do it with. The expectations of getting anything back. Like, I've never went back to Earl and said, hey, Earl, remember? Like, <laughs> like, no. Like, dude, I just did it, and that's it. You know, it's, it's done. I'm not going to, you know, go back and try to make anything of it. It's just trying to do good things for people. Um, so you're saying there's a side of the Ramon that we all don't know about. Well, they, he shows, you know, the life because that's very interesting, interesting stuff. But uh, just me seeing him personally, he does go above and beyond for a lot of people that he doesn't know. Um, so I'm more conservative. If I don't know, really know you that much, you know, I'm usually more hiding away, but I, I, I honestly, it feels so good to help people. Yeah. Um, and I feel like every year we give over 40 Christmas trees during Christmas. We leave them all in the front of my house. People come and they just pick up a Christmas tree during mm -hmm. the holidays. I'll do giveaways for the family in Mexico. Like who needs anything? Uh, we'll go to Mexico, do parties. Um, yesterday I saw a post, uh, can somebody buy this puppy? I don't have any money for food anymore i can't afford it blah, blah, blah. i zelled him over 100 bucks for here and i put for food dog food yeah. so he, it's just like random little things i don't really tell anybody he does like a lot of uh, secret giveaways like if you know someone that doesn't have money and goes through hardship and then he just needs the proof if it's in our country or something like that like the little girl in mexico they went and bought her tv and some clothing for school cell phone. and they record the video and and that's it. But I mean, he just usually likes to have a lot of people. You're a secret Santa. You have to, yeah. you have to give, give back. And what I've realized about the universe, if you believe in manifestation and the energies and all that, um, I used to think that the bigger the gesture, the bigger the reward would be when you get back. But then soon I realized, like, even if it's something small, like opening the door for someone, you know, helping somebody with this, like, oh, they don't have enough at the register here. What do you need? Little things like, the universe rewards you massively. Like the universe doesn't measure your blessing to someone with your return. The universe just throws <laughs> blessings. There's no ROI. At, there's no <laughs> ROI. You can't measure it. Like you could do the smallest thing that might feel like no big deal. You help somebody get up. The universe will send so many more times like the amount. Just because you do something big doesn't mean you're going to get it back. So even like the smallest thing just gives you the, the biggest blessing. Like I've never celebrated my birthday. My last one was when I was 10 years old. And it was crazy because this year, I don't know, he's like, we're going to celebrate your birthday. 
And I was like, I was scared because coming from this guy, I'm like, I don't know what to expect. So that's the one where Annette, the whole office went. Um, Yeah, it was pretty crazy. The Vegas birthday of all time. And I was so scared, but uh, Ramon had this crazy, it's on your Instagram, right? Oh my God. Yeah. We hired, can we say midget on the show? I mean, he's small, he's tiny. Did. We hired a <laughs> tiny human what stripper. The, a stripper. It was a stripper. Um, I didn't hear about this. We show up to the penthouse. Tiny human shows up and starts going I had no after clue all the chicks. What's gonna happen? With all these things, and it's just during the trip, just oh my God, bombing with there. crazy, crazy things. And I was, we were yeah. as we were staring at the little man, just go to town on and that and everyone. <laughs> we, were, we were staring at each other. And we we're like. Did we just become the Wolf of Wall Street? Uh, like, yeah, what? <laughs> something was going on. That's one way to live life. It was an insane, an insane experience. But this is the thing, though. All right, this is people might say, "Oh, it must be nice." Well, this is the thing. Uh, you know, people that spend without checking their balance also work without checking the clock. Mm-hmm. You know, like don't think that just because you you spend, you could also be lazy. There's no reward for the lazy. Like people that have something probably paid a hundred times right. face value for what they have. Yeah. All right. Cause first of all, you have to fail so many times to the point to where all, it almost breaks you to the point where you've been at, at your office by yourself at night with tears in your face because you haven't made any money and your, your family expects you to become successful. Uh, you will pay like a hundred times over what you get before you get what's coming to you. And so people that want easy money, the easy way out was the next scam is it wholesaling. Let's do this. Let's get that free money. What is it, crypto? Like, you will never no. make money doing that. And if you do, it's going to be a little glitch of something that happened. But in reality, you need to pay for success in advance. Everything um, with the price. One thing we were talking about was uh, uh, how to wholesale within the Hispanic community. Mm. So that's something you guys have, you know, made a name for you guys, name for yourselves. Yeah. So talk to me about that. How did that come to, come to pass? Um. Well, before we started the Dispo Company, um, somebody called us the Mexican Kegley, and we were yeah. like, "Who called you the Mexican Kegley?" There were several, Max. several people would, <laughs> several people would call us, and these guys, because these guys have Mexican people that buy. Well, because we started our journey with the lender, right? I remember so that. So she had a lot of qual- uh, qualified people that might have not gotten a house, or maybe they didn't qualify, but they had a lot of money. You know, landscapers have fifty to hundred k at all times. Yeah. yeah. Everywhere. So those were the people that we were selling deals. So sometimes we would get the scraps because we didn't know anybody, and we get the crappiest deal. We were able to sell that to people, be- and that was the way we made a living. You were selling. You were selling it to owner occupied. Owner and occupied and well, buyers. Well, well, usually most of them already have properties. Um, usually they, they want investment properties. They're like okay. rental. And they're rentals. Most mm-hmm. of the people have a lot of money. Hispanics have a lot of money, and they already have houses. A lot of people think that that they're gonna live in it. But most of them is for investment purposes. They have $100,000, $200,000. Like, Chava has so much money, and he was still working, you know, fixing stuff. My so like, private money lender is a landscaper. Oh, his private money lender, yeah. he's. Uh, I helped him sell eight it? of his properties. Eight he his had properties? about a million plus, and, and I asked Top him. Top dollar. I was so afraid to, to ask for private money, but I seen all your episodes about private money. Yeah. You're raising private money. And I was like, I'm going to ask. Hey, man, <laughs> I helped you sell all these houses. Like, what are you doing with that money? And he's like, what, do you, you want a loan? Like, mm-hmm. well, you've seen that we're serious. Like, would you? Yeah, what are your terms? This landscaper was savvy. I'm like, he doesn't oh my speak God. English. He, he doesn't speak sense. English. He was savvy. What, 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 what percent? What would you offer me? Then he became my private money guy. Just like that. I ask, and then now that's all we use for funding most of the time. So, predominantly, you have other people sending you deals, and then you would leverage your relationship between your lender that mm-hmm. you establish as a realtor, yep. mm-hmm. as well as your private money lender, Yep. And now you're selling your deals to other Hispanics yep. within the community. Absolutely. I think that's that's a huge niche that we've carved for ourselves. And people that hang out with us and learn from us go that route as well. They go hit up their friends that are Hispanics, that are doing construction, that are doing flips. And they're able to make more money and bigger spreads by mm-hmm. working with these people that are end buyers. Um, our lender, my gosh, he's been very successful Look, by working I, together. I think, I think most people don't know that, mm-hmm. I mean, if you... Do a demographic United States. How many Hispanics are here that don't speak English or that just speak Spanish? It's a huge number, and there's a huge void that anybody can provide provide them any service. Like, uh, for example, my dad he bought his house with the Harmony loan, um, and he had it like for six years. They gave him like a long six years term, but it was hard money, so he didn't have anybody to help him. 
So there's like so many people that don't have anybody to help them. You know, they're Hispanics. So if you can get a niche, a uh, small share of that market, you're going to do great. I mean, right now, for Hispanic community doesn't have enough people to help them. And yeah. it's all about adjusting, too. I mean, you right now, it, it's a game of buyers, right? Because there, there's a lot of deals, like, where people are trying to become wholesalers and get the systems. And, dude, go to a list. There's, like, 100 deals at 200 k right now in Maryville. Yeah, Ridiculous. Why would you want to go pay 10 k to lock a person at 200 when they're selling you the deal at 200 right now? Mm-hmm. Right now, what people need are end buyers that are willing to pay or that are still buying, that are still in the game. Because a lot of the savvy ones are out, and they're just kind of waiting and seeing where the floor is. But if you could grab those buyers that can afford and are still buying, I mean, that's how you're going to be able to stay afloat. So we, we've shifted our business model drastically within the past three months mm-hmm. to have more of those end buyers by targeting more of those end buyers. A lot of people forget that we had, like, the highest selling properties in Maryville for 500000 There's houses selling for 500000 in Maryville. 900 square so feet. So if you think about it, these people bought sold those houses. They dropped in 500000 into their bank account. They're living somewhere else but they have money to invest on rentals or something else. So you can tap in into all these people that actually, you know, sold at the top, but there's nobody really marketing to these people already sold and made money. I've sold so many houses in Maryville for under a hundred thousand. Just awful. Mm, yeah. It's awful. Realtor days, right? 2007, mm-hmm. 2009. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a slightly different time. Yeah. 110, 120. 40K on 51st <laughs> Avenue in his school. Yeah. Oh. Okay. So then, Identifying, you're saying like not enough people are identifying these uh, people to lend, right? Because mm-hmm. they got the money. So are they lending or are they buying? You're talking about the people that sold their house for half a million in Maryville. They're buying. I they're mean, buying. they're looking for opportunities. They know they sold for 500000 Right now, the best market is to buy low. It's amazing if the interest goes up to ten, then the house is going to get even lower. So, you know, how high can the interest really go? Even if it goes to thirteen, dollars well, the house is going to dip a little bit. But eventually, they're going to go back to normal. You know, you'll get two, three years. Um, but you would have bought somewhere at the bottom close enough. Um, so for these people that have money, you know, you just present to them that idea or so information. So how would you, right now, right? Someone's listening right now. How would they go and um, locate, uh, identify, locate? So, I mean, there's skip tracing. There's the realtor that helped them sell. Okay, so you're saying reach out to the realtor. I was going to say, like, how are you finding people that already sold, right? They're no longer on it, record. It shows on their, the realtor that helped them sell and the, buyer's agent as mm-hmm. well so they have you have some kind of connect and when you speak with a realtor they speak your language so they you explain what you're doing hey would your client that used to live in this market want to buy something at discounted when mm-hmm. they sold that 500 now they're seeing something at 200 they'd be like okay right. cool let me see if they fell in love with that neighborhood maybe they did you know, a lot yeah. of people do like for me uh, i'm actually buying a, a unit yeah. where i used to live in just to rent it out because i remember you know like i'm the buyer now see right. that's super cheap and I think also, I mean, there's so many lenders out there that don't have a relationship with wholesalers. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, if we were to start over, I mean, we would get deals that it would throw out in our lap just because we were sitting there in front of them. Mm-hmm. Oh, hey, you guys want to go deal with that one? Sure. Right? Yeah. So I think just hitting up these lenders are, are key. Yeah, people are hitting up realtors all day long. That's great. But lenders, I mean, lenders are gold. Lenders know if you qualify, you don't, where the money came from, structure the deal. They know a little bit more than realtors usually. And, and a lender works with 20 realtors. I mean, mm-hmm. realtors just, you are the realtors. How many people can you work with, actually? Right. So I actually, at the peak, I was working with a lender that had a list of 200 buyers, and we couldn't find houses for them because there wasn't enough because all the houses were, you know, multiple mm-hmm. offers. So if you work with lenders that have a big pipeline, you can structure some deals, pull them out. So uh, a great starting point then for someone listening today is to go talk to lenders. And talk to lenders. Talk to the, see their buyer database yeah. or find out what they need in their buyer database. Or are, are you just saying, hey, I got a deal that fits this box. Do you have any buyer for it? Or Well, they know who sold their house to buy another house. They know how much money people have in their bank accounts. They're asking questions. Hey, are you looking for a rental? Do you want me to keep an eye out? Like they know all the personal information for people. So that's how they approach us. Hey, man, I have this guy. He has 100K I from mean, this other house that he sold to buy another one. The, the, best buy deals, the best wholesale deals that we got were from lenders. Because you as a, let's say you own your house, but then you want to refi because you really need the money, but then you just got fired, blah, blah, blah. The lender actually needs you to qualify again for a refi. It's not like, oh, the house is equity. They're going to say, hey, you don't qualify. You don't have the job. Or maybe you don't have the credit anymore. So what do they do? They just turn you away. Mm-hmm. So with these lenders that we work with, we let them know, hey, don't just turn them away. They might want to sell quick and not with the realtor, 
So that's how we're getting like hot leads of somebody that was turned away because they can't refi or the interest is too high right now. Something's happening. So they might just want to, you know, give you a good deal. So, but you have to get creative with it too. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Think that's how the box, like, yeah, go talk to lenders. At one point we were at the swap meets with signs. Are you looking to buy a house for cash? We had signs at the swap meet. Annette was at the swap meet for a couple of weeks. Hey, look, want to buy fixer uppers? Like get creative with it. And you know, don't leave any stone unturned. Wanna buy ranches? A lot, land, people, a lot of people, like I said, man, they just want to take the easy way out. Right. How do I make it quick, quick and easy? Yeah, I don't think it's gonna be a system for those type of buyers, a system where you're just gonna like email people. Like uh we've gone away from email blasting. I think it's got too saturated, like other things like text yeah. blasting and all that. So we're more of the community base now. Uh, we even have our parents doing the the door to door, you know, thing they put on the door because they just want to be out there. But my parents made bank <laughs> like oh, yeah. a couple of months ago. They were, my my dad's a plumber and he, they also help us fix houses. And he was doing a plumbing job for this house that was horrible. Oh yeah. And he was talking to to the owner, and she was like, "Yeah, I just need to fix this plumbing thing because I think I need to sell it. I want to get out of here, the neighborhood, blah blah." And he's like, "Hey." My my son, they buy houses. Do you want like to call you? Maybe they give you a good offer. Oh, yeah. We called that day, locked them that day, sold it within a couple of days. And we told our dad, we're like, dude, whatever deals you get, like, we'll go 50-50 with you. Yeah. It's a warm lead. And there, there was like Super 50 warm. grand in that deal, and he made 25000 Yeah. Just like that. And he's like, I'm going to do more of this. Yeah. <laughs> Imagine that. Like, you hire a plumber, but you can't really afford to fix the whole pipe. So you're like, hey, just patch it up. But you're like in a nice house, but you don't want anybody to know. And you're just chopping out with the plumber. You're telling them your issues. And then they just say, hey, I have a guy who might be interested in buying. So that's the warmest lead you can get. Um, a lot of people don't know. You can reach out to roofers. Boots I mean, on the ground. Pretty much those are boots on the ground. He's done two deals in six months already. From mm-hmm. people that he's just done, done jobs for. Yeah. So, so, I mean, he's made like a good amount. Just on it. So letting everyone know what you do, obviously, is important. And financially incentivizing them. But as far as the lenders, like what a... I guess they're they're getting paid their commissions, yeah. right? When they do the transaction. So I I thought maybe some of these guys were like ITIN situations. So it's not an ITIN situation. These are just people that want to buy a house. They just couldn't find couldn't yeah. find one. They couldn't they, find one. They might be ITIN situations too. There's hard money lenders out there that are loan for five years. Mm-hmm. You know, so they might be ITIN. And, situations. and the biggest thing it would be sharpening your skills, but also having that other tool on your tool belt. You know, if you got to pull out that real estate, I'm gonna list it. I'm gonna find you a house as a buyer and connect people. So that's what we do with a lot of traditional buyers. We'll just connect them to a deal that we know you can get it cheaper with an FHA or conventional. All we did was, hey, can you see this property? We're, we're able to pick it up for less. And then the traditional realtor shows it to their buyer. And now we're able to get some commission on that. Yeah. But if we have 10 of those, that's still some pretty good commission just because this market calls out for more of that stuff right now. But yeah. I mean, look at the pitch too. Let's say right now somebody doesn't qualify. Something's going on. They're going through divorce. Some crazy stuff's happening. But they have 50 grand in the bank. Right. So why qualify traditionally for a 30 year at 8% when I could just get you a house quickly, maybe uh, under market value with equity for 10%. And think about it a year out, two years out, I get you a loan like that. You're, it's still not that much of a difference from the payment when you well, think about yeah. it right now, especially. Well, for most of those, um, we recommend that they'll purchase, they'll do some kind of uh, bank statement loan refi. And that should be it. If they want to, but if you get them in for a ten percent five year, with with somebody a private hard money guy at ten percent, I mean their payment difference isn't that really that that high. Well, so people are more open to that right now. Or the best way would be someone buys it for them and then just leases it back to them for a year or two. Right, yeah. right now is the perfect time because you can get the ten percent or the eight percent. Why go through all the hassle for an extra two percent when it's probably going to be ten percent anyways in a few months? You know. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm just saying legally you can't live in the house if it's for investment purposes. Unless your hard money person allows you. But no. No. <laughs> I'm just saying no. that right now. I'm Not a right realtor. <laughs> okay? No, and but that's why Rodrigo's here. That's why I'm here. <laughs> so you mentioned that uh, right before things reset in June, you had just bought five properties. Do you still have those five properties? We've been slowly getting out of it. I think you have. Slowly. Have that like you, two, bu- that you bought, you have one. That you were already stuck with because of long-term litigations that you barely won the lawsuits. lawsuits. Yeah, you still have one. So you have three right now. You said the words. Are you still stuck with them in my eyes? Yeah, with the five, you have one left. I wasn't sure if you were twitching or if you were crying. I wasn't (laughs) sure. I just like remember. He has one of the five, and then the other two were things that we were stuck in litigation. Just long two-year process with some houses. I ended up renting one, two of them, and then the other other ones I managed to sell, but I'm still stuck in one. 
So what are you guys doing right now as far as pivoting? Um, I mean, you got to pull out, pull out that realtor card. Uh, for me, that brings me a lot more business. Um, buyers are king nowadays. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm helping a lot of other wholesalers that are stuck in these types of deals, and they just let me know, hey, how can we, it's, it's scary how, how we get out of these houses? Um, I've helped a lot of, you could say help, but they lost money. I'm, I'm just here to mitigate how much money you're going to lose. How much do you want to lose? You want to lose 60 or you, or you can lose 30 right now in, in your investment, right? Initial mm -hmm. investment. So on one of the houses, Ramon, I told him, hey, you, you just want to like cut this thing and stop with that $5,000 a month. So we just brought in a, a traditional buyer. Uh, he's not making any money. Just take the house basically. Yeah. And then we're done. Like we, you don't need those extra baggage. Stuff. We got one of those right now that we're still trying to sell. Right. And they mm -hmm. asked for 11,000 on the bins. I was like, you guys are crazy. But also, like, we'll probably take it because we want <laughs> yeah, to get yeah. it, right? So, like, so we, we negotiated, but, I mean, it's like, yeah. You have just, to, how much well, you have well, to, yeah. we're going to lose. You, you how have much to you be lose. smart enough yeah. to know when you're not riding the wave anymore, when you just try to get it out of the wave. Because you might be on the wave or you might be at the bottom of the wave. So you either realize that here comes the wave on top of you and yeah. you move out of it or you just don't even see it and you get squished. We're just, we just focusing on generating more cash. These things, we're, we'll get rid of them, but we got to steep keep generating more money. So a couple of times we talked about you having uh, your realtor license. Mm. Uh, one thing I have found is that realtors and wholesalers are like oil and water. Oh, you know, yeah. they like, they both dislike the other side, but you wear both hats. Yeah. How has that helped you in your business? It, it, it's funny you say that because it's, I see it's very like true. HR. No, no, no. It's, it's very, tr <laughs> it's very true. I remember uh, we were working on both sides. Too. We had an office. I was on one side, 100% realtor. He was trying to do his wholesale stuff that had zero deals. So I, he's like, hey, you got to get in this. I told him, dude, once you start making more money than me, I'll listen to you. And I told him like that. That was the first time. Kanye I was, style. I, 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 told, <laughs> I stood up to him because he was like trying to, hey, I'm, that thing, you're, you're like running out of money fast. So it's funny. The first, uh, I remember it was January. He was moving back and forth, calling title. And then something else happening. And then he came over and said, oh my gosh, you got to cancel your license right now. Stop being a realtor. You're going to be a wholesaler. I said, it's crazy. I go with my little tie, you know, he's like, get over here. I'm I sure go to his office him. and he opens a little weird Excel on his old computer. I'm like, okay, what are you doing now, man? And then I, I was seeing him running back and forth all month long. And he's like, dude, all the, the deals I've been working on is going to close this week. All of them. So he had above a hundred thousand dollars in closings. <laughs> You crazy for wholesale, SOB. and I saw it, and I couldn't believe it. I was in shock. I'm a real like, hey, okay. he's like, I just made more than you in one month, and I was so shocked. I'm like, he's like, you know what that means, and I'm just his like, his brain oh. was rewiring. I said, I know, spot. I have to like turn off my realtor brain and learn how to become a wholesaler. So I was just shadowing him for like, uh, for the next six months. It was a re. Um, Rewiring. brainwashing my mind again i took him to all the trainings in the country and that's Whoever why we, training, we went to that pay. training and and then he was going to these uh masterminds or, or wholesale trains around the country mm -hmm. and then Two, we, three, and we didn't have enough money but he was like i told him well, you go you get all the information i spent fifty thousand of that hundred thousand yeah. month on it, two day intensives well he told me hey I, I i don't have to go you just get the information bring it back he said my fear is i'll get something else and you will get something else or I'll so, miss something. So I'll need you to mind. be the other person with the other mindset. And it was funny because we both took notes and, and I got something completely different with the systems and he got something completely different. And then we're like, okay, we're good to go. But I really had to pivot my brain, you know, that whole fiduciary, you feel weird and, and uh, how to speak with the buyers, the seller, how do you feel about making more money? And then uh, I know realtors usually, they're like robots, you know, and then if you don't talk to them in a certain language, it's called the realtor language, and he's like, you know how to speak realtor. Okay, so, okay, I'm on the phone. Oh, hey, how's it going? And then just the realtor language. Um, but I tell a lot of wholesalers, you have to learn their language and know their needs of a realtor. They're going to yes PDSs. They need a binser. If you don't say addendums, they're going to feel weird, and get, they're going to say, this is fishy. I don't want to work with you this immediately. Is, this is my solution to dealing with realtors. Sending an addendum, an addendum followed by a cancellation letter. <laughs> and he's like, no, I can call him and ask. I'm like, that's my way. I'm like, yeah, let's do it a uh, hedge fund style. <laughs> Send him the addendum and followed by the cancellation. That's right. how they used to do to us. <laughs> have there been situations, though, where, mm. like, because you have your realtor experience, mm. that has helped you on the wholesaler side? Oh, yeah, 150%. Can you get, I, can I, you get I, some examples of that? I advise a lot of people, you need to get your realtor's license. Um, just working with realtors. I mean, if you're talking about assignments and you don't know how to explain to them, if you're talking about how you're going to get somebody paid 
-hmm. you have to pay a realtor to, through their brokerage. You can do it differently through assignments and all these other documents. Then they but feel like it's fraud. It's nothing like it's giving fraud. them what they want and how they want things presented because maybe they want it for their W-2s or whatever. They're, the main problem is getting paid. And if they're not getting these documents from you and you're a wholesaler and you don't know about all these documents that their file needs, they're going to get pissed and they're never going to work with you. So for us, we're very lucky to inform these realtors and teach them and they grew with us. And now they know that it's, it's easy for them. And to understand yeah. what these documents are. I never understood any of that. Like, what? The, I need this document for my file. What? Sign it yourself. And, and that's how, like, no. That's how we created so many uh, relationships with a lot of traditional realtors. This is why I never brought you into my brokerage. Right. right. Yeah. It, 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 I had to. I had to keep tabs on all that stuff. For me, it's always been continued He's education. Like, no, don't do that. Uh, so much that uh, I learned the lending side, like yeah. traditional lending. I I even took all the classes. I never like finished the last test to become a loan officer but i needed to know what lending was so i can don't screw up on the realtor side well he's yeah. always studying like he even took all the broker classes too like he's always i, trying I already to learn passed all the broker more more classes more. i just haven't done the test he's well the reason trying. why i'm asking this question is because i have found it to actually be pretty beneficial right mm -hmm. like we're talking about like where deals get complicated on the wholesale side mm -hmm. like really easy on the realtor side yeah. and vice versa right like there's there, there you got properties yeah, they, they got challenges right this could be a wholesale this could be a traditional but I have found there are certain instances, even though even though it's a wholesale deal, like, oh yeah, you just structure it this way. And these mm -hmm. are things that I learned mm -hmm. from the realtor side. And right now I would say in this particular market, with the way things are going and dispo being more valuable than acquisitions, working with buyers all these years as a realtor, you understand the psychology yeah. and you can explain it in such a way as like, oh yeah, that makes total sense. Whereas before, you know, it was order taking. Dispo has been order taking for the last three years. Yeah, like that. And all the order Internet. takers are gone. All the, well, all people the aren't taking orders anymore. There's the, where are the orders? <laughs> yeah. Oh, you haven't done deals in three months? Oh, I guess you were an order taker. Yeah. yeah. So I think that there's a lot of uh, valuable uh, oh, translation yeah, sure. skills right now. Um, it's It's been interesting, man. Uh, but honestly, people grow from it. You know, like, even if things are going bad and difficult and people are in a tough situation that might have gotten purged during these crazy last few months, I mean, it all happens for a reason. Yeah. All right. Just because you aren't the right person for this doesn't mean you're not the right person for something else. You know, so people out there, don't get discouraged, man. Keep going. Hell, you know, everybody goes through that. It's just part of the growing process. I mean, I think everyone had to lean up in the last months quick and yeah. then uh, just lean. It, it's testing the teams. Uh, if you haven't leaned up and there's still people that are order takers or just, you know, collected that check, you know, don't have them there. Don't waste your time either. Um, for us, I always made sure that I was telling somebody why I, I was giving them a certain type of advice. Hey, what should I do? And then it'll be like a five minute whole conversation of why I, I decided that so that they would learn. So we're lucky that our team, you know, stood with the, with us and they're still learning. But I, on my realtor side brain, I tell them why I'm giving that answer so that they can choose like right. in, on their own. So I got one question before we go to the audience. So you did not want to be in the news. Uh -huh. oh, not for that. It was flattering at the beginning <laughs> until they were chasing me. We know where you live. This is your address, huh? I'm like, oh my god. How but I address? saw you again uh, with your son and furniture. Oh, Here we yeah. go again. So oh, talk to me about my that. Twitching again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I was in Vegas celebrating our anniversary, and at ten o'clock at night, while we're eating in this fancy French restaurant inside the wind, I get a call from the police, and I don't answer. Because I'm scared. And so I hear the voicemail. Well, it's normally unknown, right? Uh, no, unknown. this is the cops for yeah. sure. And voicemail comes in. We have found your son speeding in your Range Rover through the neighborhood at over 100 miles an hour. Like, oh, my God. And so by this point, we already had gone through a lot of little issues with him as he's rebelling because of the teenage years. So the wife's like, you deal with it. You deal with Probably it. Probably not that different than you. Right. Yeah. Pretty much. <laughs> well, maybe she would have. The, yeah. Done it a little bit different. <laughs> so she's like, you, you deal with them. I'm like, are you sure? She's like, yeah, okay. I show up. I say, okay, well, you don't want to listen, blah, blah. This is what we're going to do. You, you're not allowed to have anything anymore. So I gave all his stuff away. Uh, it, was, it was still crazy because the news got called by a neighbor or someone. They show up, what's going on? And I made him write on a sign apologizing to the neighbors. I'm sorry I was speeding through the neighborhood. I was trying to shake it out of them because, I mean, like, if you don't shake it out of them, they it just... It was going into bad situ in the in a bad situation. Like they would bring him in the middle of the night because he was in a fight with somebody. I didn't even know he snuck out. It was just going 
from bad to worse. And I'm like, this is the wake up call he needs. So I give all this stuff away. News shows up, it goes viral. I was getting calls from England, from every state in the, the country. Local, I was in every radio station. I was the talk of every radio station locally. And all of a sudden, I was doing interviews nationally mm-hmm. about this topic. Uh, it kind of backfired because I thought he was going to learn his lesson. But then he shows up to school, and he's the most popular kid in school now. Oh, Miller. He was little little Tate you know, at like... school. <laughs> uh, and so he was the badass. The bad the, boy, that's right? right. I, that's me. I ride around in, in Range Rovers. Now, a girlfriend and everything. I'm like, what did I do? Like, this totally backfired. Didn't work. It did not work at right at the moment. And now? Eventually, it they, did. It did work. Have to go through he things. had to go through things uh, for him to grow and find his, him, his identity. Mm-hmm. And now he's great. Great person. Like, we're, But we had to go through these growing pains of him going from a kid to now a young adult. You know? Yeah. Um, but but yeah, now that was great, and now we look back and we laugh at it. But um, I mean, I, I think it's awesome, right? Like, obviously, it's complicated, potentially traumatizing, but we're doing our best as fathers, right? Yeah. And you're trying to instill values in your boy, right? Somebody that doesn't care wouldn't do anything. Ah, oh, knock it off. Yeah, he's just you know he's just a teenager, dude. Right? You know how heavy that furniture was. <laughs> I took off all that for the second story, second floor. Yeah, I saw. It was it was painful for me to drag all that down, but but he's not gonna be driving hundred miles an hour in not residential anymore, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, we're gonna jump into the audience questions. Before we jump into the audience questions, we're gonna do a quick commercial break. So on uh, YouTube, we got Jose Sanchez. You guys know Jose? Of course. We, yeah. know, we know all Mexicans. All right. So they, they'd like for you to sing something. Oh, my God. Are you serious? He knows us that much, huh? Oh, okay. He knows from the, the, from the band days. Uh, all right, I was about to get real loud. All right, go ahead. Can we sing some? What do you want to sing? Well, uh, the only one that you remember. Or, or anything else. Yeah, I guess we could do that one. Oh, si eres pobre. Yeah. Yeah, easier. Okay. Si eres pobre te humilla la gente, si eres rico te tratan muy bien. Un amigo se metió a la mafia porque pobre ya no quiso ser. Ahora tiene dinero de sobra, por costales le pagan al mes. Oh, there you go. That was awesome. Little mob song from back in the day. That was great. I mean, I remember when you first uh, started working with us um, and I was like, are you serious? He's like, yeah. And you sent me a video. I was like, okay, he's serious. He is not kidding. Sweet. Well, we recorded over 30 albums. We toured the country. We, we went viral for fighting famous singers on, on TV. We were, uh, I think uh, we did the whole House of Blues tours, reality we're, shows. We were playing arenas. We, it was crazy times. And then we quit. Yeah, we, Why'd was, you quit? Uh, because we realize unless you became super famous and we were just more like a supporting act for these tours you were never gonna make more than you know like well you can make it a normal job yeah i think the most we were making was like maybe like a thousand each a weekend touring so unless we got our major break we became the headliner we we were which was fine right but once you have kids family things start happening and uh and then all of a sudden see we're playing mob songs like Corridos and all these crazy songs. There's a I lot don't know of what altercations. Mob songs are. Yeah, we drug cartel style lyrics. There's a lot of altercations at the clubs that we're playing. We were at one point, right the two sides of each side of the mob were here and we're playing, and they pulled out guns at each other and they were just on a face off. Everybody just pointing guns at each other. We're on stage. They rush us down from the stage. I was hiding behind people. Well, yeah. And then I was <laughs> like, okay, well, I guess I'm not doing this anymore. <laughs> 
<laughs> and that was my wake-up call. Yeah. Uh, uh, Joshua Ortiz on YouTube wants to know what marketing form is working best for you guys in the Hispanic market? Uh, Facebook. Oh, Facebook yeah. right now. For, for wholesaling? Just for your, yeah, for Hispanic, uh, wholesaling in the Hispanic uh, so community. For wholesaling, we, we've, we've trialed a lot of, lot of things. You know, cold calling is always great, of course. And we've never stopped co the cold calling. But Facebook, we've seen a lot of results in. Um, and that just keeps consistent inbound leads coming in for the team. Um, and I don't think we, we've got some great returns with, with just Facebook. Uh, Wardle Lingus wants to know when's the next event? The next event, uh, when Steve Trent is, is ready to speak at the next event, we'll oh. have to coordinate. Well, oh. we'll see. Name the day. All yeah. right, you got to work with Josh on that one. Well, <laughs> and uh, work with Josh. So on Facebook, Scott Dawson wants to know, and I'm, I can't read or I can't speak Spanish. Man, Scott, right? Scott Dawson, so, Scotty. Que comen los tiburones? Minnows. <laughs> <laughs> Boom. <laughs> what do the sharks eat? Ah, they eat the minnows. Right? There you so go. you have to evolve from minnow to shark. Uh, Ian Ross, is that a mindset you've always had, or is that positively something that you develop throughout your life? And we we're talking about how you deal with adversity, right? Like you just you don't there's no struggle, you just keep going. Well, people have a, a great opportunity right now when the chips are down. When the chips are down, you have the opportunity to become amazing. You don't become amazing when things are going great. Because anybody can be great when things are going great. Right in the wave. They're right in the wave. But when the chips are down, that's when you grow. And when the wave comes back and things start, because it's cyclical. I mean, they tell you in the front of the thing, the packet, cyclical. Yeah. They're giving you the code. All right, so if it was great, now that means we're about to go to the other side. But eventually it comes back around. And those that develop skills and have amazing processes, that have amazing people, are going to become one of the wealthiest people of all time because they made it through the good and the bad. Mm -hmm. yeah. But people quit during the bad. Oh, I guess it's bad. Let's see what else do we do now. Um, and I get excited. When I started noticing this three to four months ago, I was like, the purge is coming. Oh, purge yeah. is coming. A lot of people are getting wiped out. Purge is coming. And they did. A lot of people did couldn't make it, unfortunately. But the people that were still here struggling and fighting every day, like we're getting stronger by the minute. Every war that we go into, we become stronger, smarter, leaner, faster. And, I mean, you know, that's how superheroes are made through adversity. But going to Ian's question, have you always had that mindset? Um, I, I, think, I think we have. I think we've always had it because, first of all, we, we came here illegally. Um, we, we used to be in horrible Situation. We used to sleep in a in a family's trailer yeah. on the floor of their trailer, on a two bedroom small trailer in the hood, Buckeye and Thirty Fifth Avenue. Um, we used to be the family that the church would come over to give food to because yeah. they thought we were gonna die. We were the refugees pretty much when we got here. We used to sleep, sleep in crack houses, literally I, crack I houses. I remember he wanted to make extra money or anything at all, so we had a just to wipe down the to clean the the windows for cars. So he would take me to one of the like the food cities. And then he's like, well, who's going to want this? They're going to say no. So he, me and him were just washing all the windows. We didn't care who, which one it was. So when people started coming to their cars, we're like, hey, we just washed this. They're already washed. This is up to them to give us money or not. Mm -hmm. He's like, it's a numbers game. Let's just wash all the windows. And then we'll see Whoever's who gives coming. us money. They're, it's already washed. They don't have to give us money. So, so we already did it. So we're that family, man. We used to live in little one. There were studios. Uh, and the church would come to our house and give us food because they thought we weren't going to live because we had no money. Yeah. Eventually, it got so bad that we couldn't even afford that crack house that the church took us in. We lived at a church. And we were living at the church for about a year with another family. And we were separated. Our bedrooms were separated with curtains, like sheet, bed sheets. Just bed sheets, That's yeah. what they were separating our rooms. And we'd always be at the church grabbing the free food the that they had. and for donations. That's where we lived for the longest time. So anything better than that, we're already winning. Yeah. You know, uh, we could never afford to, to have a house. When we tried to buy a house, my parents lost it in 08. Um, and so then we had to go back to renting again. And it's just been a crazy roller coaster of highs and lows and well, just trying. I really um, love this, this story here. You know, and I think that there's, it's easy to say you guys had um, an unfair life, but you have it, you look at it as you have basically an unfair advantage. Because yeah. you can't be knocked down because you've already been there. Where, where, where am I going to end up? At the, at the church? Yeah. You know, like, dude, it could, whatever happens, it's always going to be better than, than we, we've and, been at. And any, anything that happens now is, is just amazing. 
uh, I, I was seeing Ramon's little girl turn 15 and got her permit. So Ramon never got his permit until like he's like 20 something. We didn't have papers. We I didn't have papers. So. It wasn't legal until I was like So 24. we see it with the permit. It's very cool because like, hey, they're getting this other experience. Uh, but for us, we, we didn't have any papers. And, and we we're traveling banned without papers. Imagine that. So we're passing through all these states where it was immigration. And, we got deported almost a couple of times. Um, yeah, we got it, so lucky. It's, it's just luck. When they stop you, they call immigration. Something happens. Luck. They just let us go. Oh my God. Yeah. But uh, it's part of the fight. I mean, everyone gets their own, you know, go at it. You just have to make do. Yeah. Uh, Richard Hicks, find it hard wholesale in Hispanic markets because they always have a family member who can fix everything. So I'm guessing this is if you're trying to buy a home from a Hispanic person. Have you guys run into that? Yeah, and that's fine. I mean, we know going into our strategy that 99% of the people that we talk to aren't going to be qualified. Some people get stubborn and they try to sell a person that they shouldn't try and sell and the deal doesn't even go through, they wasted all that time. Like, we're just skimming. Mm-hmm. Our, our acquisitions people are just skimming. Go and do, they, do they fall into the criteria, yes or no? And well, I mean, go. if they can fix everything, that's why you love them as tenants. Usually they'll just fix everything. So that's a, that's a big plus. Uh, Christian Hernan on YouTube from Memphis. Uh, have you guys done business with Valentin Trujillo? Uh, Valentin we, Trujillo? We've never done a deal, but we know him. We, we know yeah, we know him. Because he's Mexican, so, right? Yeah, we, we, uh, yeah. we, we go to the same <laughs> Mexican monthly meeting. Uh, uh, Stephen Collar on YouTube. When we sell the market, we give him a cheat sheet in Spanish with contacts and HVAC and hard items. Uh, on uh, Instagram, Paulina, as a buyer, should we talk to lenders as well? So I guess if they're buying properties from other wholesalers, should they be talking to lenders? Yeah, oh, yeah. They should be talking to everyone, yeah, for sure. but especially lenders, because lenders... Um, they they're hustlers too. They're trying to get paid too. So there's so many opportunities. And the with thing, lenders. thing is, you're if you're buying, you want to meet these lenders to know if they already have somebody pre-qualified, mm-hmm. and then you could just skip the whole realtor thing in the middle. Yep. And then Daniel Quijano says, "I need to bring more Latinos on the show." So <laughs> I, I think we have a good amount. I don't think we discriminate. Right. It, the thing is I'm that Latino. I I think it is not so much that <laughs> to bring more on is that they haven't got enough education to to become wholesalers. Mm-hmm. So uh, I've been seeing our events. Uh, you're getting more Hispanic uh, realtors that are l- starting to become wholesalers. So it's more of a, there's not enough of them out there. Mm-hmm. Maybe that's that's the situation. Well, I think, uh, you know, what you guys are doing and what Carlos, right, what Carlos Reyes has mm-hmm. done, right? I mean, I think they're they're lifting them yeah. up pretty well. Just had Victor, right? Victor wasn't here uh, mm-hmm. not that long ago. I, I think I'm just going to say, Daniel, you're just wrong. Yeah. We're just going to leave it at that. <laughs> there's uh, been at least two. Come on. <laughs> I have one friend. I have that one Hispanic friend. Um, so Edwin Rodriguez on YouTube. Uh, are are you talk? Are, are you guys referencing hard money lenders? Uh, what you guys talk, talk about talking to lenders? So can you clarify? Are you talking to regular mortgage lenders, hard it, money lenders, it, uh, or both? It's it could be. It, it's all of them. I mean, you can't discriminate. Oh, this is a hard money lender, but they also usually do traditional stuff too. I get deals from hard money lenders all the time because they're taking houses back too sometimes. Right. Hey, they hit me up. What can you move this one for? I'm taking it back from this guy. Or they'll have investment properties too. Hey, are you looking lenders, at selling any of those? Lenders are savvy, man. You, they'll start doing traditional for the family and then they'll start offering hard money lenders, but then they have a real estate license and then they're the investors themselves. So many people would disguise themselves as, I am a realtor, but you don't know that he's also a jiu-jitsu master and then he's a plumber and then he's a scientist. And But a lot of people, you have to ask those questions. Hey, what else do you do? Mm-hmm. And it just opens up this huge thing. Um, and then Rush and Nico on Instagram. Are you guys from Vegas? We are. I wish. I, I, I mean, I, I, I think I'm from Vegas now, man. I, I'll <sighs> qualify for that. Honorary Vegas residents. We we used to fly to Vegas every weekend. Man. We went on a Twice three a month Vegas binge where every weekend we were in Vegas, 100 percent for hanging out. I, I love uh, every Texas Hold'em. Every get the the. the the cars, gambling. It's not even gambling if you know what you're doing. Play, Who's better at poker? Oh, def- this guy for sure. I mean, when I try, um, but... Uh, I'll, I will lose less, but he's better. I don't I don't know that I'm better. I mean, if I try, I can be good, but we put these poker games together with some of your friends. I know, you text it. me about them. Yeah, yeah. and I'm, I've never won. I'm luckier, I've but he's won. better. I've lost <laughs> thousands and thousands, maybe... 20,000 already in... So you're just advertising for this event is what, is what I'm hearing right now. <laughs> well, well, this is the thing. We do deals with a lot of the guys that play poker, so I'm like, yeah, I lost 20, but I made you know this amount by doing uh, deals with well, these guys. The, this is a guy that he's read like 
so many books on poker and tails. What, how, how do you bet? Doyle Brunson. I think that's helped him with mm-hmm. his sales skills. Like how much you bet, how much to pressure a person. And Dan then, Harrington. And then you get a yeah. bunch of uh, tails on people. So he definitely knows his stuff. Um, and he'll risk more be based on that information. So you just he listed, knows. right? So you said Brunson, Bill Harrington, Brunson. Dan Harrington, yeah. Sklansky. Phil Ivey, Phil Helmy. Daniel Granu. Daniel Granu. Um, so who's your favorite um, poker player? He used I mean, to like Phil. Uh, I mean, Phil Ive is a beast. You know, he's probably the goat. But Phil Helmy is usually Phil love that guy. entertaining. Because he, he folds aces and he shows them, hey, look, I just folded he's aces. So it's amazing. And he used to do that back in the day when I used to play with him. Like to other people just to say, I know what you have. And he's like, look, I have aces and you probably have this. And he he calls people's hands. Hey, you have that. I'm like, how do you even know that? He's like, well. Probably Daniel Negreanu. I mean, he's the most likable guy. He's Daniel definitely Negreanu. the most likable guy. But I can see a lot of Phil Helmuth in you, right? Oh, do you, yeah. do you yeah. scream at someone for playing hand poorly? <laughs> I yeah, try that, not that's to. That's probably the mouth. Right? The <laughs> mouth. Like mouth, like mouth as well. Mouth. <laughs> you used to, to play professionally as well. Uh, sort of. I played. Yeah. Yeah. And I would always do well in the local game. Mm. Uh, and donate in Vegas. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's usually our... There's nothing more... In, I, I love, I love um, playing above my level of comfort. Mm-hmm. And that's the uh, only way I get excitement. Right. That's crazy. Like, I sat down at a big game in Vegas with $3,000. And I called that the big game mm-hmm. at the Bellagio. And then a guy next to me sits down with $30,000. Mm-hmm. And then the guy to my right sits down with $40,000. Yeah. And I'm sitting here with $3,000. And my heart was pounding every second until they took me out. Because I... It, it, was enough. Enough. it was last year. I sat at a table. It was a 2040, right? Um, yes. 2040, no yes. limit. Yeah. That's the game. Right? That was sat, bleeds. Yeah, so I sat at that, that game. And I was like, okay, like this is entirely uncomfortable. So uncomfortable. It is. And I but look we, over here. loved it. And there's like a half million at the table next to me, right? Like, it's... Uh, I feel it, right? <laughs> it's, all right, well... <laughs> That's how you get the adrenaline. I feel completely point. inadequate. Well, he was dragging, me. dragging me to Vegas since, uh, I think I was 18 years, 19 or 20. With fake IDs, we're all just going to Vegas and playing. Well, this is the thing, though. I have uh, my little vision board kind of notes, notepad, of things that I want to accomplish or happen as a, as a carrot to get to the next level. And so, you know, one of them was when I get to $100,000 in the bank account, I'm going to buy myself a watch, right? Like a, like a decent, not something crazy. And so I, like a $5,000 tag, career, right? And so I, I got it. But I have a list. Okay, when I get to 200, then I'm going to buy this other thing. Three, and I have it all the way up to like five mil, ten, you know? And so at every level, I have something that I want to do. And I think at the like the three million level, five million, something like that, one of my to-dos as a marker to to stamp that moment is to buy into one of those big games in Vegas to the Bobby's room, you know, with like 100,000. You know, like that's uh, yeah. that's going to be like the marker at that level. Just got like a carrot to always keep trying to chase for more. Yeah, I'm with you on that. I haven't pulled the trigger yet on the World Series. Um, oh, that's also series. on there, you know, 10, yeah. the big game. I mean, it's 10,000 just throw away because you know you're going to get crushed, right? Yeah, uh, I mean, maybe a satellite. You'll play though. some satellites. Uh, no, I would just go straight, I would just to go the straight too. Yeah. Oh. yeah. <laughs> but that's a story. Uh, Daniel Quijano wants to know, hard shell or soft shell? Tacos? Mm-hmm. Soft shell, baby. Come on now. Dude, hard shells. Hard I, shell. I love hard shells unless it's like authentic Mexican tacos. Tacos orados. It has to be a, a, a soft shell, like With potato. Arena, you know, soft shells. That's what it's depending at. where potato. I'm at. Hard shell potato. Dude, uh. Taco Bell or oh, Del Taco? That, that's what I would ask that guy. What? Uh, Taco Bell or Del Taco? <laughs> del Taco. Neither. Neither. I mean, if you're, if you're already there, I mean, <laughs> Del Taco. Uh, del Taco. Um, and the Steam Collar says Wells Fargo is now doing iTunes loans. I had no idea. Oh, nice. That's cool. Cool. Uh, Sorry about what happened with Wells Fargo, by the way. I, oh, wow. I yeah. was there right before it happened. And Didn't they, uh, I ran right before huh? all the Wells Fargo things were happening. Right now? They fired what? No, no, no. A couple the... years back, oh. I was doing so much business with in Wells Fargo. Yeah. They changed all the comp They plans. changed all the comp plans because of what it, certain individuals. Um, and the Russian is, uh, Nico, what's your C-spot for days to close, close the escrow day from purchase date to uh, uh, on their agreement? So how much time do you give yourself to close? A lot. Nowadays, you have to give as yourself 30 you days. Can. Even 45, people used to pull the trigger, hey, three-day close, four-day close, because you're fighting with so many other wholesalers. But now most of the wholesalers, you know, they either stopped or they're not getting enough deals. Now you can be picky as a buyer. So, you know, be as picky as you can. Give yourself 10-day inspections. We're doing that on all the deals. Hey, 10-day yeah. inspections, 30-day close. We're, more even, we're, we're not giving them closing costs either yep. on these cash offers. We used to. Yeah. Um. What's your favorite listings? What's your favorite list to cold call? Juan Martinez. Uh, I'll be honest, man. We haven't 
really looked into list in a while just because we we downloaded all of maricopa like everyone else and purchased jared just gave it to just yeah, split with everybody yeah well, there you go he sold it to a guy that sold it to us uh, and so everybody has the same context so we left it on play and just let it run forever. It's crazy how people are making money still on that. Like I have a guy that he's like, I'll show you this list. And 5, I'm like, and they're still reselling that same list. <laughs> you're like You're wholesaling a list or you're flipping yeah, like, a list. So, but I mean, if I had to go back to my days when we were doing that, um, liens. Liens have always been amazing for us. Every new state that we would go, we would go into, because we tried a lot of states and we were getting deals in a lot of these states. Yeah. It was liens. Like we would always get a deal through liens. But right now we have the cold callers going, but it's just an auto play. Sometimes we'll get a niche list of something and we'll target a certain area. We'll adjust it for just a minute, but then we'll just put all play on all and just call everything. I still remember this back when we were uh, working with you guys and we were coaching you guys. Um, one of your guys was texting me. Oh, I remember. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I still remember I that conversation. Yeah. I was like, who do you work for? Like, I, th- this script looks very familiar. Yeah. <laughs> who do you work for? Oh, my God. And so I, I booked a call with you, and you didn't know who it was. So that was classic. That was awesome. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's cool when you, like, you'll call people out, and then they're like, is this Ramon? Yeah. Like, I get hit up all the time to sell houses. Like, people, hey, you want to sell your house? I'm like, hey, bro, if you have any houses, let me know. I'll help you move them, blah, blah. And guess what? Maybe I'll put you on my events. They're like, this is Ramon. Yeah. And I'm like, who is this? <laughs> it's me, man, Michael. <laughs> Michael, how's it going? Because <laughs> everybody knows everyone in town, yeah. so it's just it's awesome. Well, I think you the way you carry yourself is obvious, right? We can say, "Oh, this is definitely Ramon." Mm-hmm. Um, is this Ramon? Like, oh, that's the best. On uh, YouTube, Cisco Luna wants to know what country's next. For what? What country is next for travel? Mm-hmm. Um, that's a good question, man. I just got back from Dubai uh, a couple of months back. Amazing. Amazing. I'm, I'm loving mind. Mexico for some reason now. I we, we weren't traveling that much of our own country, um, just because of the the myths of all the cartels, crazy stuff like that. So I was always a little bit scared of that. Yeah. But recently, Ramon's been taking me to like Vallarta. These places are amazing. Like so, Mexico is definitely. I think a Dubai. Big one. Dubai is probably next because my dad always wanted to go to Dubai, and we had Dubai already booked. Oh yeah. Pre COVID, and then they canceled everything. Our next trip is Dubai. So we I think have Dubai the, definitely yeah. want to make that happen sooner or later. Uh, besides financial freedom, what else do you guys love about real estate? Uh, I love that it always changes. It's like you're trying to control it and master it, and then like it'll humble you in a minute. When you feel like you're the, the genius of the world, then you feel also like you're the dumbest of the world at the same time when something... Because there's so many different scenarios, and when you think you got it, then things shift, and all of a sudden you have to play another human that you never knew you needed to play. Mm-hmm. So it's always humbling you. And like, the, the change opens up room for new people. You know, there's always new faces, so, new characters. So that way, the people that's been here for a while, they got to pivot, mm-hmm. or they're gonna, you know, get canned. And also helping your friends get to that next stage, because I'll be talking to people, right, and they'll say to me, "Hey, bro, remember when I was at your training?" And and I'm like, "You were at my training?" <laughs> and they're like, "Yeah." I'm like, "Oh my god, it worked!" Yeah. Yes. <laughs> you know, because sometimes you feel like. Did it help anyone? You know, because sometimes we get information and try to do, do little pop-ups and help some people out. But you don't know if it really helped. But then once you see a good majority of the people that were with you through mm-hmm. those times do deals and they're still involved, like, oh, my God, I think some of the stuff that we were sharing actually worked with people. Well, I mean, like you said a moment ago, right? Like, I had no idea, like, my meetup was your first event. That was a, yeah. yeah. So that that's awesome. Great food. Was, I love those little sliders. I oh, also yeah. love those sliders. <laughs> um, what, is your, what is your why? Um, my why, I, I think with, with kids, it's crazy because like all your whole life, you design it around your kids. I remember five years ago, I was thinking, oh, my daughter's 10. Oh, five years that she needs to do her quinceañera. I need to have money like ASAP in the next couple of years. At least in the next three years, I need to have money because that's expensive. It's going to be 20, 10, 20, I don't know how much it is to do that. So my why was that? And all of a sudden, like, I was on go, go, go mode because I need to make money for that because I'm like, how am I going to pay for it if I had no money to live? And so I think your wife, as long as you have kids, it's always something linked to your kids. I mean, and your family. That, that's really that's really it for me. For me, it's just time. Uh, very conscious of time, uh, different uh, rhythms that you have at different ages. So if I get to be like 60, 70, it's going to be a different rhythm. I don't want to be clubbing Paris at you know 80 years old and oh, dancing. I just want to, I, I know that certain age ranges 
I can do different activities. So I just want to experience those at different levels as well. If I go to Paris now, I'll be hanging out at a club. But if I go to Paris in, in 10 years or 20 years from now, it's probably going to be having a cafe and something chill. But I just want to experience a bunch of things that I like personally, artistically, see all these monuments now and just time, you know, uh, enough that I can. And I think there's some people that aren't conscious that there's different seasons for everything. Like some people's waiting for the, the whole that I hear all the time, delay gratification, delay gratification. Well, the guy that told me that died six months later when I first was starting yeah. to make a little bit of money. He's a good guy. So I think it's how we are all raised in our environment. If the guy telling you to delay gratification dies six months later of some crazy cancer that hit him, yeah. guess what I'm going to do? Not delay gratification. I'm not going to delay gratification. <laughs> no way. The yeah. guy that was preaching that to me died six months later. Like, real story. Good friend of mine. So that's that was my environment. That was my surrounding. So guess what? I'm delaying nothing. And in reality, how much money do you really need when you're 80? You know, you're not looking for uh, millions to survive. You're just sitting. You can barely walk. I'm, I'm just trying to get all those experiences in. Uh, because guess, guess when I'm going to sacrifice? When the kids are grown up. I have all that time to sacrifice. I want to be a workaholic. I'm going to do when they're not around. And, and the best thing you give your, your kids not money is, is information. You teach them. You show them how to open up a bank account, how to better their credit, how to buy their first investment. All this shit's free if you already learned it. So you don't want to give them the money. You want them to make the money and feel happy that they created money on their own. And now they're hunters. But if you want to leave them a million dollars, you pretty be scared that they're probably not going to go the right direction. I think I a, a great book on that topic, if anybody wants to, to, to read, which is great, is... Um, Die with Zero. I don't know if you've read it with Bill Perkins. Oh, yeah. Die with Zero really puts it into perspective of how important, you know, memories and, and all these experiences are. And he calls it, memories are the currency of life. Mm -hmm. So that's definitely a, a book that I would consider yeah. like an audible. For sure. Um, it just puts things into perspective on how time with money and experiences means different things at different times of your life. Uh, I didn't get an answer from you that I recall. So besides financial freedom, what else do you love about real estate? Uh, I mean, that I'm able to create stuff from nothing. I have a choice in how much I make or how much I can evolve myself personally. With my nine to five, that was the thing that I just hated, no control. I already had my whole future planned out, 65. Quote was gonna keep moving up, but it just felt like I was working for the, the machine. You know, I can, my mind is about creating things and, and it was already written for me my whole, uh, my whole life. So just real estate gives me uh, uh, a canvas, you know, how much do I want to create? And it's always testing me because I'm very conservative. Buying the Lambo gave me a heart attack. I didn't want to buy the Lambo. I wanted it, but in reality, I didn't care for that heart attack of, oh, why should I? I don't deserve this. Um, he always tells me I'm push harder and get things that you feel way uncomfortable. And he, the second he knew that I, I was like freezing up when he told me, hey, you should get a Lambo. I was like screaming and yelling, oh, I don't have nothing with that. And then once I got it, I overcame that fear of, of buying something expensive mm -hmm. that in my mind I was blocked. And that helped me now because Ramon's like, oh, we should get a jet. On, on that note, I think Lambo owners should become a protected class. Because oh. we get so <laughs> much crap from everyone. Those people with Lambos. Like, I'm, we get uh, so much I'm, crap I'm, from I'm in that Lambo. category. Oh. So much crap from you. I'm like, dude, I don't even want to drive. I feel horrible. And the funny thing for the Lambo, <laughs> I've I've had so many people drive it that would have never driven one. Even our the guy that does remodels, remodels and little kids and stuff. And the people's Lambo. It, it, so many people have been in the car and <laughs> just, you know, it opens up dreams for other people. So I'm like, hey, if eventually I don't have it or something happens, I, I'm going to let everyone basically feel that experience for one second. Here's my excitement, something that I've never really talked to anyone about. Uh, I'm excited that whoever comes across our business or works within our business, uh, I'm excited to know that they're going to have a better future, right? Just because somebody's working with us right now doesn't mean that that's the end, right? Everybody that's working with us is learning continuously. And, you know, it's only a matter of time. It's all, it's all a school, you know? Instead of them working for somebody that where you're just inputting data all day long, you can't grow from that. But seeing us on a day-to-day -day basis, seeing how we can make $100,000 from thin air, that is real-life experience that somebody's taken and is jotting down. And, you know, that's just exciting for me. Like, yeah. I'm, I'm changing somebody's life at some point. Um, and it's like a real school. I mean, you know, I'm sure people being around you all day, they're taking all the things that you do on a regular basis that makes you successful. So for us as well, people that are around us, 
they're seeing how is it going. They're seeing how we handle different aspects of the business. So it's like one giant school. Yeah, no, that's powerful. Um, what is your biggest struggle right now? Uh, what do you mean? Biggest struggle? What are you dealing with right now? Um, I became some kind of workaholic, you might say. I don't really enjoy um, taking so many trips as of now. He doesn't, he doesn't enjoy not working. Uh, yeah, Ramon gave me a cat, and then I couldn't. I, I'm like, I can't take care of this thing, man. Like, he's like, you need a cat because you, you live alone. And blah, blah. But I, I love what I do right now, Cute and cat. I have to, like, take the foot off that, you know, pedal. But uh, uh, just spending more normal time doing other normal stuff but i like to work right now and and i told this guy hey right now i love being a workaholic and i'm gonna push this thing and we're gonna be keep doing great you you know you love what you do when you're done at the end of the day and you feel weird like you mm -hmm. feel out of place because you're not doing that are you home you're supposed to stop and yeah. hey how's it going where's the break immediately. or like the weekend it's friday uh no no no, no. Yeah, it's not exciting. Yeah. but then you start thinking oh wait I'm getting inbound calls, so I'll send it to the team. Things are happening. So you're sort of like cheating and still working a little bit. Yeah. And, and it's not, I think he's asking about struggling how to get deals and stuff like that, but I've always been with the community. Um, I was I had different uh, uh, marketing within the community, which is just, uh, just uh, flyers, talking to realtors, talking to lenders, talking to anybody. Business owners are big ones that buy from us. So uh, on that side, we're, we're okay, I think. What's your biggest struggle? Um... My biggest struggle, uh, you know, as a, as a business owner, you know, we, we have a huge responsibility, you know, to people that work with us, that look up to us. You know, there might be people I don't even, we know personally, but are following our journey that want us to succeed. Maybe that want to have the same life at some point, that want to do the same things for, for their family. So my biggest struggle is trying to become a better person, trying to be, have a better company, try to have better processes, try to find the next niche marketing to Trying to optimize the machine, trying to lean up the machine. I mean, there's so many things that we need to work work on as a business owner because there's a lot of people behind you, like saying, "I'm still here," you know. Mm -hmm. Like so, sometimes we we lose sleep trying to become a better person, and um, I think just that alone, it's a huge struggle to, to try to become better every day. So yeah. so that way, people feel like they're in the right team. Because there's nothing worse than, you know, people saying, oh. Is there an example recently where you felt like you struggled here? Um, yeah, I mean, in the last four months, you know, during the whole shift, you know, we were doing 20 to 30 deals a month, right? And as a business owner, okay, great, everything's going good. So I don't really look under the hood that much. And then we went to zero deals for like 16 days. Real talk. Zero deals for 16 days. And we, that's never happened. We usually two, three deals a day. And so I'm like, okay, well, let's look under the hood. What's going on? I started running numbers. Who did so many deals in the last couple of months? Blah, blah. We started looking, and there was a lot of things that weren't really going that great internally. But because we're doing all these deals because of the order taking, um, it felt like everything was right. So I was like, don't mess with anything. Like, even if people aren't doing that great. And so I think just looking under the hood and realizing that all these different things shouldn't be that way, that was a struggle for me to readjust as quickly as possible. What were some things that weren't? Going the way they were supposed to be going. Well, I mean, we had people that hadn't done deals for three months. On your team. On my team. I think it's the, the market shift. So I've always known that in real estate school, they say every six months, the market shifts somehow. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we as the owners have to change the knobs. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is the new formula. So we were quick about that. But that was um, the thing because it was the three months when things went the other other direction. Hard. Hard, yeah. hard. We're, people, we're having people that were doing 10, 15,000 a month commissions. All of a sudden, you know, some of them were doing maybe like half, and then some people were haven't seen yeah. it, but they were salary too. So making those decisions were the most difficult. I know for Annette, because Annette's the disciple manager. So thank God. So she was the one that had to do a she lot of a tough decisions. Conversation. Um, but, but I mean, I can see that it's touching you, right? It's, it's yeah. affecting you. Yeah. So like, yeah. what was it specifically that like? Well, letting people go because the people that you hire are amazing, right? Because for you to hire someone, you have to know that they're better than you. Mm -hmm. And so all the people that we hired that we had to let go, I knew they were amazing. They were way more qualified. Some of them had PhDs. They're and so for us to make those decisions, that to readjust, it was, it was very tough. Because we knew they were amazing people, but they were amazing people in the wrong time, in the wrong wave. Or maybe 
if they would have had more time during the right time, they would have grown into these other people. And it was either make a business decision or have your business go in the red very quickly. And then we might not even be here at this point. So, I mean, you've seen Facebook. They're what, laying off like 11,000 people right now? I heard something about that. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, it's, it's adjusting. And for us, we're, we're a small company, right? We're like 12 people. Yeah. But we have to make these decisions very quickly in those couple of months in order for us to still keep a profitable, you know, lean business. So that, that's, that's very difficult. Cause, I mean, every single person that we work with were amazing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, what is your superpower? Um, I think my superpower is not being too attached to anything, to processes. Like, we will change our business model, the drop of a hat. Um, sometimes people take too long to adjust. And, you know, we would have taken an extra month, an extra two months to adjust. That would have been horrible. Can you imagine? Like, at some point, like, your business is not even profitable. You know, you're dipping into other forms of income to keep it going. Um, I think being able to adjust is, is, a, is a good superpower because companies have gone out of business. People that you've had on this show might not be around at yeah. some point now that we know. Um, so, and that, that might have been because maybe they didn't adjust as quickly as possible. And maybe they had businesses that are way too big because it looked amazing to have a whole boiler room of people, you know, and, and I think that, you know, just being able to adjust is what's been able to keep us we went from a lot of people to just a couple of key people and we're still here going and now it's turning around. I mean, we had one of our biggest days yesterday, right? Yeah, we like we threw in like 30 and a, a couple of weeks. We, we got in a couple of de- weeks, which is like bare, you know, 5,000 assignments, 10,000 assignments. And yesterday I think we threw in like 35 ish thousand dollars in yeah. one day. So that we saw again, like, oh, okay, here we go. How about it, you? It's where we keep pivoting. And for, for Ramon, I think his superpower is more of a, he'll, he'll uh, assume that things are going in a certain direction and plan for them. And he already knows they're going to happen. It's kind of weird. He always says, okay, we're going to do this. And then we're going to get all these trips. And then, oh, well, what are we going to do is we have to allocate some money to that. Oh, we'll get it somehow. Don't worry. And then it just happens. Like he's always done that. So it's like, even with the flips, he just assumes that things are going to work out. And then for some reasons, like magically, they just work out like this pivoting. He assumed, well, you'll find a way or you'll, you'll get an our deal. We'll get, we'll, we'll get an our deal. Hang in there. Hang in we'll there. hang in there. And then, we find a way again, and then we find a new way of working this new market. What is your superpower? Superpower for me is uh, thinking. I just stop and think. That's what I tell everyone. He has everyone. the highest IQ in the office, by the way. We yeah. took IQ test, and I was like, <laughs> not that high. I was like no, 30 no. points under his. There's other And he was, he was pretty. He was, well, yeah, kind of in the office, but I mean, there's other people there. Well, now there's people with higher IQs, but... That's the thing, like, IQ doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be successful. No, it doesn't. You can have a high IQ and not be successful in a role. You're just probably, like, in the wrong we, role. We uh, know what type of IQ is the sales side of it, and they're going to be great. But usually if you're very high IQ, you're not going to be that great of a salesperson. You need to be in the usually. middle IQ to be a good salesman. Because if you have yeah. too much IQ, you overthink too much. and then you... My whole thing is stop and think. And then if we all decide this is great because, we also have to think, well, why... Isn't it great? You know, give the other side a, a, an option as well. Um, why shouldn't we do this? Or why isn't that other option better? Now, now, to, fighting shot? now, to be fair, for those people whose businesses aren't doing that great right now, maybe they put a pause on it. It's not the end of the world, right? People always start it again. Maybe they're taking a, a, some time. So I think that's the beauty of real estate. You know, you, you hit a roadblock. You could always take time to reassess and reinvent yourself. Mm. Maybe look at other strategy and, and go back and do it again. And then maybe become successful again. Um, I, and, and I think that's something that sometimes people might feel like, oh, I failed. I'm never going back. No, people can start again tomorrow. Yeah. Start a new strategy, show up to the events again and get the ball rolling. I think having the connections is probably the most important thing. If somebody already has the connections, I mean, it's easier for people to pick it back Much up. Much easier. Oh. Uh, Daniel Quijano is questioning or is disappointed with how his name was spelled. So um, what we need to do is you need to become a super fan and tip, and then maybe our guys will spell your name correctly <laughs> oh, next time. <laughs> um, what book have you gifted more than any other? Uh, the Richest Man in Babylon. It's such a basic book of just basic laws of business, and it talks about uh, don't do things that you don't know anything about. You know, if you don't know something – hold up and wait till you know enough about something because it's more likely it's not going to work. I don't, I don't know about Dogecoin. I don't know about these other things. 
You know, if, if people lose money in things that they know about, you imagine going into things that you don't know about. Or don't get advice from a bricklayer on Dogecoin. Like, exactly. You lay brick, or well, do you know so much about Dogecoin? Or? Exactly. So just stay <laughs> stay in your lane. That that book is is so clear. It's just some basic fundamentals. I How think. about you? Uh, what was the question? What book have you gifted more than any other? Okay, so uh, this is not a book where it's about business or anything like that. And I've always remembered this book. It's actually the first book that this guy gave me. Uh, it's called The Giver. Mm -hmm. uh, they made a movie on it. And it. Uh, I always compared that even today of life. Um, it's just a book uh, where everyone sees everything in black and white. And then for some reason, one kid is able to see in color. And then he starts seeing how amazing the world is. And it doesn't have to be structured. And then you can think for yourself. And it's a big, like a big brother type kind of book. And uh, that's how I see just life in general, you know, try to see things in color because we might all be seeing everything in black and white. I think another great book is uh, how to influence, how to win friends and influence. Oh, yeah. That's, uh, that's a really good, it's a good yep. book as well. So I want you to think about last thoughts you want to leave the listeners with. I'll make a couple of quick announcements. Guys, if you have value today, please like, subscribe, share, comment. Uh, we want to help reach more people. And I think, you know, there's incredible value given here today. Only see 24 thumbs up, but 47 watching. I'm not as great as math, but I think, you know, <laughs> it could be a little bit closer. Uh, and then we do have our live sales training event. If you guys are interested, go to millionairesupport.com. Talk to my team. We'll get you set up. And tune in next week. We got Chad Young. I'm excited to have him on the show. So what are some last thoughts you want to leave the listeners with? Um, I think you guys need to just surround yourself with amazing people, follow amazing people, see what they're doing. Just surround yourself by people that, that are doing better than you. Uh, cause ultimately, you know, that'll, that'll make you into the person that you want to become. You know, you've always had your slogan. I'm on the journey to create a hundred millionaires. And I was like, Oh, cool. I want to become a millionaire too. You know? And then I was like, so then you start thinking and in the subliminally, you know, you, now you're, I'm listening to you say that over and over and over and over. All of a sudden you become a millionaire. And just because of you listening to somebody that makes me, well, how do I be, you know, how do I become a millionaire? How does that happen? Initiate. And just by surrounding yourself by people, eventually somehow it happens. Like overnight, some things do go right. But can you imagine if I wasn't even around that or listening to that or surround, I wouldn't even, Oh, sure. thinking of that but you mentioned oh, i'm gonna create 100 millionaires i'm gonna get and i was like oh i want to become one of those how do, I, how do you sign up sign up for your course um kept going kept trying never gave up you know we all get a turn i know eventually something good happens mm -hmm. and sometimes it's like that one mob guy you know just outlast everyone at some point oh, and maybe he'll Michael make it francine you, <laughs> you just yeah. just stay stick you with it you know? everyone this guy's still around Oh, cool. What are they doing? Are you saying you are a millionaire? I'm saying I have properties. Asset-wise, I mean, you're a millionaire. Yeah. But I mean, what's All right. asset close to nowadays? Close to multi-millionaire. You're more, right. uh, maybe last year multi, but now the properties so, went out. Uh, so Everybody, right? Definitely got to talk to Josh about that after the show. <laughs> uh, last thoughts you want to leave everyone with? Um, so uh, I'm a believer of working with people that don't know much but have a lot of energy. Mm -hmm. um, it, I, it's harder to work with a person that's already a millionaire and already does his thing and he doesn't need an extra 10000 an extra $5,000 so I always pride myself in uh, uh, helping someone that has the energy and will commit 150% uh, to this industry um, for example I've paid for licenses for friends that are, we're doing deals now like I told them hey do your real estate license oh but I want to wholesale and I'll get your license and then they'll, they'll show that you actually have the initiative so get a call. Hey, I got my license. I'm like, oh shit, this guy really did what he was gonna do. But uh, people don't understand that when you work with new people, they haven't made a million yet. So if they're the ones, they're the Ramon, the new Ramon that he's gonna make a million with you or without you. I want to help you out. You know, if you're new, you don't know your stuff yet. All you need is be pointing towards the right direction. You know, definitely uh, reach out. Uh, I I would I'm am gonna tell him, hey, get a real estate real estate license, or start doing these activities. But I work with a lot of new people. And he does that. take time to speak to people and he listens to them. Mm. Like for me, I'm the one where I'll swipe up like the moment he, I get bored. He's generation uh, uh, TikTok swiper. Yeah. So Every he, three he seconds. He actually listens. You know? you know, me and Ramon, uh, I can only talk to him for five to ten seconds and I stop. 
and your turn because he will get bored he'll fall he's like oh okay and he's gone so i understand that about him annette does that a lot she gets bored oh <laughs> But that's a TikTok generation. So I'm trying to set a yeah. record for, for for holding his attention. Yeah, it's, it's very uh, tough, but I mean, that's that's how it is. How can someone get a hold of you? Uh, phone number. You can just call me out, 602-405-8318, 602-405-8318. We also have the Instagram, Rodrigo uh, Hoso Sharks. How about yourself? Yeah, yeah. Instagram's probably, probably the best way. Uh, Hoso Sharks, pretty straightforward. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, no, before you wrap it up, man, I just want to say thanks you know, for having us, for having us here. This is definitely uh, one of the best experiences we've had, and this is definitely up there with our wish list and our vision board. You know, I drew ourselves like this. I painted a canvas of us sitting here. Believe it or not, I'll send it to you via mail. And so now to be here is definitely um, a great, great experience. Well, if Ramon would have told me when we went into the first Disruptor, which was my first event, I, w- I wouldn't believe him. Like, hey, yeah. one day we're going to... Uh, doesn't make sense like because you're the new guy and all of a sudden you see all these people that made it and you're like one day i want to be one of the people that, that feels like they made something you know and so just to be here i mean it's, it's just amazing for those people watching i say it a lot you know keep going uh we all get a turn it's true we all get a turn you even made the hats keep going right and and <laughs> it's not always positive you know we all get a turn at sadness we all get a turn of happiness we all get a turn of money we all get a turn of you know brokenness but you get a turn of everything so if you haven't gotten a turn of this i mean just hang in there keep going only if you don't quit people that quit nobody will ever hear the story that's true go go thank you my friend thank you man thank you see you guys next week shout out to steve train jump on the steve train we real estate disruptors